Hello, welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about the central nervous system. We will be studying about this brain, the contents of the brain, various functional areas. Then we will be discussing about the embryological aspect. We will be discussing about the ventricular systems that is present inside the brain. Then we will be discussing about the spinal cord. Okay. So let's go ahead. So if you look at the objectives, uh, you have to describe the structure and functions of major parts of the brain, then how the brain is protected, okay, about the uh, brain that is connected by the skull bones, then the meninges, that is three layers, dura matter, arachnoid matter, and pia matter, and the fluid that is circulating inside the brain in the ventricles of the brain called the cerebrospinal fluid and also the blood brain barriers which is called as choroid plexus which is producing the csf so we will discuss the physiological aspect in depth about that okay then there are uh, sensory motor areas and various uh, functions other functions of cerebral cortex we will be discussing and also the spinal cord anatomy these are the learning objectives okay so uh, hopefully we will be able to cover then coming to the uh, uh, the neuron i mean the embryological aspect the development okay so the embryo you have uh, ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm okay so this ectoderm is the outermost layer which is completely deriving all the nervous structures which is completely deriving all the nervous structures so uh, uh, you know what the brain is not fully developed even at the time of birth okay it grows up to two years after birth also okay uh, then uh, it also keeps growing after two years. Actually, the myelination, the formation of myelin sheets, I would have told in the previous lecture, the formation of those myelin sheets are taking place only after the birth. See about the uh, neural tube on this spinal cord. Okay, what you see here is, in this slide, is this uh, 15 week, this is uh, five weeks brain structure and 13 weeks brain structure. 26 brain structure and during the time of birth you have the brain structures like this okay so this the fifth week it is just like a small neural tube this is just like a small neural tube okay so uh, this neural tube it keeps growing 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 and uh, this area bulges this area bulges and then it forms into two hemisphere here at uh, around 36 week i mean at the 13th week this area start to bulge it's called as forebrain i will tell you the other names of that also at 26 week if you see there is less number of sulcus and gyrus you see in the brain this pit is called as sulcus and this elevation is called as gyrus so this sulcus and gyrus are formed at the time of birth at the time of birth okay in case if this uh, sulcus and gyrus is not present the brain will measure around 2.5 feet 2.5 feet into 2.5 feet uh, area okay so in order to condense this the sulcus and the cerebral cortex is condensed and this sulcus and gyrus are formed and the sulcus and gyrus are formed okay so coming to the namings of this area so what you see here is the picture of a neural tube what you see here is a picture of is called as prosencephalon and the blue area is called as mesencephalon and the green area is called as rhombencephalon so in layman language you call it as forebrain midbrain and the hindbrain forebrain midbrain and the hindbrain okay so if you look at this uh, prosencephalon you it is dividing into telencephalon and the diencephalon so the telencephalon is the cerebral hemisphere and the diencephalon is the thalamus okay whereas in the midbrain 
the mesencephalon is de deriving the midbrain okay then the hindbrain the rhomboid cephalon is deriving into metencephalon and the mylencephalon the metencephalon is the pons and the cerebellum and the mylencephalon is the medulla, medulla and the spinal cord okay so in this cerebral hemisphere you have the lateral ventricles third ventricle and in the midbrain and the pons level you have the fourth ventricle that we will discuss with the later slides okay so just know that for fore brain it's also called as prosencephalon mid brain is also called as mesencephalon and the hind brain is also called as the rhomboencephalon so this is what you have to understand in this place coming to back to the slide so if you see here this prosencephalon is the cerebral hemisphere then mesencephalon and the rhomboencephalon you can see here okay so these are the alternate names so for you to remember you remember as fore brain mid brain and the hind brain okay so this is what uh, the embryological aspect is so next if you go to the next slide um, the basic patterns of the cns is central cavity surrounded by a gray matter external in which to which is white matter as shown in the figure so if you look here now we have to understand the gray matter and the white matter i pre in previous classes i told you the gray matters are nothing but the bunch of neuron cells the white matter is nothing but a bunch of neuron cells okay the gray matter is responsible for carrying the motor impulse and white matter is responsible for carrying the sensory impulse okay so in, uh, there are many areas we call it as nucleus okay for example if uh, uh, a nerve is starting the nucleus of the nerve is will be one in one area okay so these are all nothing but the collection of bunch of neurons that is doing specific function that is doing the specific function you see here this is the the yellow part i mean the brown area is the gray matter in the spinal cord it is located in the inner aspect whereas the white matter is located in the outer surface of the spinal cord whereas in the brain if you see brain and the uh, uh, cerebellum if you see the gray matter is located in the outer aspect whereas the white matter is located in the inner aspect okay the gray matter is located in the outer aspect the white matter is located in the inner aspect so i would like to show you another one uh, neuro atlas so it will be easy for you to understand okay if you look at this page if you look at this page what you are seeing here is this uh, the outer area it has the gray matter the outer area it has a gray matter whereas the inner area it has a white matter okay these are nothing but the fibers okay these are nothing but the different types of uh, neuron uh, tracts we can call it as nerve fibers or you can call it as nerve tracts whatever it is okay so this is all you have to understand is the outer surface of the cerebral cortex is having gray matter the white matter is in the inner aspect the white matter is in the inner aspect okay this is what you have to understand here understand so coming back here okay now what we are going to see is the ventricular system in the brain okay so this is nothing but the empty space inside the brain the cerebrospinal fluid is produced so where the cerebrospinal fluid is produced so to understand this uh, you can you know you can call this as uh, empty space okay the hollow space where the cerebrospinal fluid is produced and it is being circulated between the ventricles and also around the brain and spinal cord okay so for this we have to understand the 3d view of the ventricular system so what you can see here is the anterior view of the brain and this is the lateral view of the brain in that there are two lateral ventricle is there one third ventricle is there and another fourth ventricle is there okay so all this uh, the third ventricle 
and the uh, lateral ventricles are connected likewise the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle are interconnected so i am going to show this to you in a 3d form okay what you see here is the skeleton and inside which you have the complete nervous system you have the complete nervous system inside you have the complete nervous system inside and i have to remove the skull in order to approach the brain so for time being i will remove this uh, uh, dura mater i will remove the dura mater then i will also remove the arachnoid membrane and the pia mater it is just a membrane that is just sticking to the whole outer surface of the brain so pia mater is not a separate membrane actually okay pia mater is not a separate membrane actually okay so what you see here is the uh, this is the right hemisphere and this is the left hemisphere this hemisphere is separated by this cerebral fox this is nothing but extension of the du matter dura matter we will separate discuss it separately now to view this uh, ventricles i have to uh, remove one lobe okay one lobe and hemisphere okay so now what i remove both hemisphere inside this hemisphere only the ventricles are present and these are the corpus callosum we will discuss about this later i am trying to remove all the other structures except this ventricles okay so i, I have removed all the corpus callosum also and now what you can see this blue color area is the lateral ventricle this blue color area is called as a lateral ventricle it has anterior horn and also this is the posterior horn okay and this is the lateral horn or also called as temporal horn so in order to see this is the lateral ventricle there are two lateral ventricles this is the right lateral ventricle and this is the left lateral ventricle and i have to this other structures in order to show you the third ventricle in order to show you the third ventricle okay so i will remove these are all the thalamus anyhow we will be discussing about each and every organ separately uh, but before that we have to go step by step okay because neuroanatomy you have to understand right from the beginning right from the beginning okay these are all limbic system organs okay now i i remove the complete uh, thalamus and uh, the structures present inside the brain so now what you see here in the center is the third ventricle this is the third ventricle okay this is the third ventricle This is the third ventricle. Okay, you see, this is a lateral ventricle, and this is a third ventricle, and this is a third ventricle, and this is the fourth ventricle. This is the fourth ventricle. So what you can see here is this lateral ventricle is connected to the third ventricle by this interventricular foramen. This by this interventricular foramen It means. Spinal fluid that is produced is, is coming to this third ventricle through this interventricular foramen. Okay, then this third ventricle is continuing as a small narrow tube that is called as cerebral aqueduct, also called as aqueduct of Sylvius. Okay, aqueduct of Sylvius, also called as cerebral aqueduct. So this cerebral aqueduct is a very narrow tube that is running in the pons. This is the pons area, and then coming to the level of cerebral, uh, I mean pons and medulla oblongata. Inside this, you have this is the place where you have the fourth ventricle. So the lateral ventricle 
down here is connected by the lateral ventricle down here is connected by the interventricular foramen the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle is connected by this cerebral aqueduct and then tube in the spinal cord it is continuing as a narrow tube in the spinal cord as a central canal in the spinal cord when you cut the cross section of the spinal cord you can see a narrow hole in the center of the spinal cord okay so that means what the series of fluid cerebrospinal fluid from the lateral ventricle it come to third ventricle then through the interventricular foramen from third ventricle the fluid comes to fourth ventricle through this small cerebral aqueduct from fourth ventricle it goes inside the uh, central canal and goes all the way in the middle of the spinal cord but you would have heard the cerebrospinal fluid is circulating around the brain that is the layer between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater we call it as subarachnoid space okay we call it as subarachnoid so here if you see uh, that subarachnoid space is connected by this lateral aperture and the uh, medial aperture there are two lateral aperture one in the right side and the other lateral aperture is present in the other side. I will remove the cerebellum and show you. Okay. Okay. So I have to remove this points also. Okay. Now when you, this is the two lateral aperture and this is one medial aperture. This is one medial aperture. Through this opening only the CSF is coming to the subarachnoid space that is circulating around the brain and spinal cord. Okay, so uh, that uh, that's the place where the CSF is circulating around the brain and spinal cord. When you study meninges, you will understand. Okay, you will, you will understand. These ventricles are interconnected. These ventricles are interconnected. These ventricles are interconnected and they circulate the CSF in the ventricles as well as around the brain and spinal cord. So this is what you have to know, know about the ventricles that is empty chambers uh, that is present inside the brain and uh, spinal cord. Okay, brain, the brain stem areas. Okay, now you have understood the lateral ventricle, third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. Okay, this uh, lateral ventricle this lateral ventricle, third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle. Okay, so now let's go to the next objective. So now we are going to study about cerebral hemisphere that consists of cerebral cortex, white matter, and the basal ganglia. Okay, these are the objectives. Explain the major lobes, fissures, functional areas of cerebral cortex, lateralization of the cortical function. Lateralization is it's very simple. Like you know, you would have heard the right brain is controlling the left body, and the left brain is controlling the right body. This is what we call it as lateralization. I will tell you. Then uh, differentiate between the commissures, association fibers, and uh, projection fibers, and describe general functions of basal nucleus. These are the objectives. So what you see here is the complete the right lobe and the left lobe this is the right lobe and this is the left lobe okay sorry not lobe right hemisphere sphere is this this is one sphere okay half is hemisphere half of the area is hemisphere okay we have the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere okay so both this hemisphere is connected by the corpus callosum if you look at the um, uh, cross section of the brain so you will be able to understand so before going into the lobes let me explain this uh, uh, cut section of the brain okay okay now you see here is the cut section okay the midline cut section this is one lobe this area is one lobe and the left lobe is present adjacent area both this right lobe and the left lobe is connected by this junction this is called as the corpus callosum this is called as the corpus callosum this corpus callosum is connecting the right brain with the left brain this corpus callosum is connecting the right brain with the left brain okay so here students what you have to understand 
this is very uh, technical area mm -hmm. uh, there are three types of how we will we will discuss about those fibers so just remember the right brain and left brain is connected by this corpus callosum and this is the part of the brain that tells the collators the commissural fibers we will discuss about that and in the ventricles this is the cut section of the ventricle this is a lateral ventricle and this is a third ventricle inside the ventricle you have this red color mesh we call it as the blood brain barriers okay so here also you have this blood brain barriers they only produce csf okay so this is called as uh, the medial aperture and the lateral aperture that is communicating to the subarachnoid space and to the subarachnoid space the CSF is circulating this area is the subarachnoid space the area below the blue line is called as subarachnoid space the area below the blue line is called as the subarachnoid space and uh, the blue color line is this uh, dural venous sinus that we will survive discuss separately so no need to confuse with that okay now let us go to the various uh, lobes of the brain now let us go to various lobes of the brain okay so what you see here is the cerebral hemisphere okay uh, as i told you gyrus means the elevation okay sulcus means the pit okay in the brain uh, the outer cortex if you see there are a lot of elevate elevations and depressions so the elevations we call it as the gyrus and the pit we call it as the sulcus so there is a big sulcus center of the brain that is between the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe and there is big sulcus uh, lateral sulcus we call it as lateral sulcus between the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe okay so there are five lobes in the brain frontal lobe parietal lobe temporal lobe occipital lobe and the uh, insula we will see discuss these lobes one by one so before we i go into this lobe let me show you all this uh, lobe in the uh, 3d model so that before you study about this lobe you will be able to have a better understanding okay you will be able to have a better understanding so what you see here this is the frontal lobe this is the uh, I will let me remove one hemisphere with one hemisphere we will study okay so I will remove this cerebral faults also and this is a frontal lobe okay which is, is uh, located in the anterior aspect of the brain which is located in the anterior aspect of the brain this is responsible for all this um, memory intelligence cognitions planning reward attention short-term memory everything okay the frontal lobe is uh, mainly for intelligence function and memory also okay and this is the parietal lobe okay so in between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe there is a big pit, pit this is called as a central sulcus okay so this central sulcus is the pre-central gyrus okay we call it as pre-central gyrus and is the post central gyrus this is called as the post central gyrus and both are both this area is responsible for sensory and motor function okay so this uh, parietal lobe is mainly responsible for sensory and motor function okay this is the area of the parietal lobe and this is the occipital lobe mainly responsible for the vision and the spatial processing okay more motion perception and all this stuff so if the, there's damage to parietal lobe occipital lobe the patient suffers from vision loss okay immunopsia or different kind of conditions are there i will teach that in uh, optic nerve injuries okay then this is the uh, temporal lobe okay in between the temporal lobe and frontal lobe there is a lateral sulcus this is called as a lateral sulcus this is called as a lateral sulcus so the temporal lobe is mainly for hearing functions and auditory functions then the vernicus area the mat mathematical ability area is present here broca's area is present here in this region so we will uh, so just in 3d model just know what are the different types of lobes that is present okay then we will go for each and lobe level functions in your side so frontal lobe parietal lobe this is a parietal lobe then temporal lobe occipital lobe okay 
and this is a central sulcus and this is a lateral sulcus and this is a lateral sulcus don't go inside the brain don't go inside the brain just stay only in the cortex stay only in the cortex region okay so okay so what you see here is the uh, frontal lobe frontal lobe parietal lobe occipital lobe and temporal lobe okay the insula is present in the inner aspect of the temporal lobe okay next when you come to this uh, uh, cut section of the brain you see this is the central sulcus this area is the central sulcus and this area is the lateral sulcus central sulcus and the lateral sulcus area okay so this is a pre central gyrus the elevation here and this is post central gyrus both of them responsible for sensory and motor function both of them are responsible for sensory and motor functions okay so the pre central sulcus this is the central sulcus okay so <clears throat> this is the longitudinal uh, i mean uh, this is a midline that is this is the midline that is separating the right hemisphere with the left hemisphere okay now uh, when it comes to the cerebral cortex okay there are three things you have to understand the cerebral cortex and this various functions then the internal white matter and the basal ganglia okay so you have to th study three parts in the cerebral cortex okay the cerebral cortex which is having the gray matter the white matter which is having all this uh, uh, projection fibers that is the nerve fibers and then the basal nucleus which will process all these motor signals we will, we will go ahead and deep about that okay so coming here what you see here is the cut section of the brain in the anterior side so outer gray matter you have seen inner white matter you have seen and here you have ventricles this is the ventricle so this this is the gray matter white matter and this is the ventricle lateral ventricle so what you see here is a two egg shaped structure okay so we call it as a thalamus so these areas are the basal ganglia these areas are the basal ganglia okay and uh, the fibers that is running here is the internal capsule we call it as internal capsule i will explain that in, in depth in the next slide okay so the cerebral cortex composed of this gray matter okay which is consist of neuron cell bodies dendrites and the glial cells okay so these uh, cells are metabolically active the cerebral cortex has three major functions one is the motor area sensory area and the association area okay so that is what we are going to discuss in depth so this you see the mapping this area is responsible for seeing that is present in the occipital area the hearing area is located in the temporal lobe the speaking area is located in the uh, lateral sulcus area that is the broca's area and the thinking area is responsible in the uh, frontal lobe okay so these are the brain small um, mapping plan so let us go about the lateralization process so you would have heard about the right brain is controlling the left body and the left brain is controlling the right body left brain is controlling the right body so why is that because the right side this right side nerve fibers at the level of the pons for example if you see this is the brain and this is the spinal cord this is the spinal cord this is the brain and this is the spinal cord okay so what happens here this right side fibers come at the level of the pons and then pass through the left side of the spinal cord likewise left side fibers comes at the level of the pons and cross through the right side spinal cord so when there is damage in the right side brain the left body gets paralyzed okay when there is damage in the left side brain then there is the right side body gets 
okay so this is what we call it as lateralization so still deeper if you want to say only 85 percent of the fiber is crossing in the opposite side remaining 15 percent of the fiber is traveling in the same side of the spinal cord this is what the literature says so let us see various functional aspect of uh, different cerebral cortex area so if you look at the frontal lobe here don't uh, confuse with everything okay just frontal lobe this, this is the frontal lobe this is the frontal lobe this is the frontal lobe frontal lobe okay so the frontal lobe is responsible for intelligence function this area is responsible for intelligence function what is this intelligence function like memory multitasking behavior then management thoughts then working memory memory special all these are related to intelligence so suppose if a person frontal lobe is damaged you will be roaming out like a mad person you will be roaming out like a mad person okay so coming to this uh, uh, central cell so this is the uh, uh, area where the eyelid movement is present this is the area where the eyelid movement is present but so this is a junction between this frontal lobe and the parietal lobe this is a junction between the uh, frontal lobe this is a junction between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe so this is called as pre-central gyrus and this area is called as post central gyrus okay this pre central gyrus is present responsible for motor function and the post central gyrus is responsible for sensory function okay so when when you speak about the word motor when you speak about the word motor what happens the this this area suppose you want i want to move my hand i want to move my hand so what happens the this area this is the parietal lobe pre central sulcus area it will produce electric impulse that electric impulse travels to the goes to the basal ganglia from basal ganglia it comes to spinal cord okay that is the right side impulse will go to the left side of the spinal cord so my left hand will move okay suppose uh, if there is this area is damaged if this sensory area is damaged there will be a lot of sensory disturbance in the body see don't think that only pay when pinch that is sensation there are many type of sense okay auditory sense visual sense taste sense touching sense then pain is a sense every different type of sense are, that is a different field okay just know that suppose if there is if the middle meningeal artery is damaged if the middle meningeal artery is damaged and uh, this area is accumulated with the brain and if the area goes for ischemia what happens the opposite side of the body gets paralyzed this is what we call it as hemiplegia is paralysis of one half of the body hemiplegia means paralysis of one half of the body okay so coming to this uh, post this is post central sulcus area it is responsible for sensory function the post central sulcus area is responsible for the sensory function so there are primary somatosensory cortex somatosensory association cortex okay so then here this area is responsible for taste this is the uh, sorry this is the, the area for the taste then there is something called Wernicke's area this area is the Wernicke's area okay this area is the Wernicke's area which is responsible for mathematical ability okay if uh, anyone is good in maths um, the Wernicke's area will be very powerful okay so uh, this is the, the Wernicke's area which is responsible for mathematical ability then coming to the occipital lobe occipital lobe you have this primary visual cortex and visual association cortex okay area number 16 and 17 actually there is a numbering system there is a neuro neuro neurologist called broadman
okay so what did we want to study the brain so what happens we couldn't uh, those days there is no clear idea how to divide the area of the brain and study okay so when you open the brain there is no color difference there is nothing so but each and every area is more unique and more specific so that is why he started to give a number okay area number 43 44 16 17 okay that is called as broadman numbering system but we are not following the broadman numbering system to study the brain cerebral cortex okay so keep in mind that this area is responsible for vision okay the occipital lobe this area is responsible for vision and the, this is a visual association area okay so these are the various uh, then the auditory area is present in the temporal lobe the hearing area is in the temporal lobe the hearing area is present in the temporal lobe so these are various cerebral cortex function suppose if my right occipital lobe is damaged what happens my uh, i get uh, hemianopsia that is it's a, note down this word you can note uh, google it h e m i h e m i a n o p s i a hemianopsia okay and just you can find out the meaning of this word and uh, have a better understanding okay i will tell about that when i teach about the optic nerve okay so we we'll go to next slide so when i cut the midline of the brain so the right brain and the left brain is connected by a corpus callosum this 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 fibers are called as the corpus callosum the right brain and the left brain is connected by corpus callosum this is the empty space i told you okay this is the ventricle so inside this uh, corpus callosum uh, you have same uh, this frontal lobe this is a frontal lobe parietal lobe then occipital lobe and temporal lobe is present in the but there are some other structures inside the uh, brain we call it as a limbic system we can put these uh, structures under limbic system so the limbic system organs are this phronix the limbic system organs are the phronix the hippocampal gyrus hippocampus this and uncus okay and there is cingulate gyrus i mean okay all this amygdaloid body how this structures they come under limbic system i will show you in the 3d model it will be, will be having a better understanding we will be having a better understanding so we will finish this cerebral cortex and go as i told you the motor area is present in the uh, parietal pre central sulcus area where the cortico spinal tract will start okay what is this cortico spinal that is uh, this tract it starts in the cortex this tract it starts in the cortex cerebral cortex and run all the way for example okay so what you see here is the cerebral cortex okay the cerebral cortex and then this is the cortico spinal tract okay it starts in the parietal lobe it comes all the way through the internal capsule okay and you have the external capsule here this is the external capsule and this is the internal capsule it comes to the pons and between the pons and middle of lungeta the right side cortico spinal tract goes to the left body and likewise in the left side the cortico spinal tract will go to the right body right spinal cord what you see here is 85% of this fiber goes to the opposite side and only 15% of the cortico spinal tract comes in the same side of the spinal cord okay that is why when there is damage to this left hemisphere of the brain the right body gets paralyzed here okay suppose if you are a right handed person if you are a right handed person the left brain will be more active if you are a left handed person the right brain will be 
if you are left handed person the right brain will be more active okay so likewise this is called corticospinal tract we call it as a projection fibers okay they start in the cerebral cortex and run all the way down through this fibers only the motor impulse will travel and it reaches your muscle through the nerve okay i want to contract, take a cup of coffee and drink my parietal lobe will uh, generate the uh, pre central sulcus cortex will generate electric impulse and it will send all the way through this come to the opposite side and the nerve will pick that and then this nerve is connected to my biceps muscle and thereby this is how this uh, corticospinal tract works okay i hope this will be clear let's go to the next area so this mapping shows the how this uh, somatosensory and the motor cortex is as well. you see when you cut the brain in this area these areas are these surfaces are responsible for tongue movement swallowing function facial movement and the limb movement okay whereas in the sensory aspect all the sensory information comes to this topmost area face uh, sensory in, in, input and the uh, taste sensory input all these are processed in the lateral uh, cortex area okay so this is the just a rough image which area is only for which function so let's go to the premotor cortex area that is responsible for all basic motor functions and the broca's area see there are two types of broca's area sensory broca's area and the motor broca's area so this broca's area is responsible for speech functions this broca's area is responsible for speech functions and it is present in the anterior cilavian sulcus we call it as cilavian sulcus if you see this uh, this is the broca's area this is the broca's area this area this is a cilavian sulcus this area is the cilavian sulcus let me this area is the cilavian sulcus this area is cerebral sulcus and this area is responsible for the speech area okay so for a right hand person this left uh, side broca's area will be more prominent will be more active okay so uh, generally when there is damage to the left thing speech is also affected you can see in the patients who have uh, cerebral uh, i mean hemiplegia one side of the body is paralyzed so what happens they have tough time in uh, uh, when there is left to brain damage there will be right side body paralysis they cannot speak properly whereas same thing when you see for the left side body paralysis patient uh, they can speak properly because the right brain is damaged left brain is not damaged as i told you left brain is more powerful and more active for right handed person okay so what you see here is the motor area so the frontal ideal area is located partially and anterior to the premotor cortex area and superior to broca's area it controls voluntary movement of the eye voluntary movement of the eye then coming to the sensory functions see there are different types of sensory functions okay one is primary sensory somatosensory cortex and somatosensory association cortex so these are all the integration centers vision sense the optic nerve is responsible auditory sense the ear uh, temporal lobe is responsible then olfactory sense the smelling sense the olfactory nerve is responsible then the gustatory sense that is a, a taste sense that your tongue is responsible then visual visceral sensory or areas for example uh, if there is pain in the heart immediately you, you feel if there is blockage of uh, coronary artery you feel severe amount of pain in the heart isn't it so these are all visceral organ senses okay then the vestibular sense okay the cerebellum is responsible for body equilibrium okay i know that i am standing 
that is due to uh, cerebellum function okay suppose if i drink too much of alcohol i sh i shake my body because my cerebellum function is suppressed so that affects the equilibrium cortex okay so these are different types of sensory sensory functions in the body there are uh, different types of sensory functions in the body okay so now uh, let's uh, discuss about the prefrontal cortex that is involved in the uh, this cortex of the frontal lobe the frontal lobe area which is responsible for the intelligence function which is one for intelligence function complex learning abilities and then recall and personality okay so even if uh, you see people who have frontal lobe injuries they just walk like a mad person okay so then working memory okay if i am teaching anatomy so uh, this is my work okay that memory has to function okay like abstracting ideas judgment reasoning planning okay uh, so this is the complete for responsibility of the frontal lobe so make sure that your frontal lobe uh, is intact okay then uh, posterior uh, association areas where there is tem the temporal lobe which is responsible for hearing auditory function occipital lobe which is responsible for vision function and the parietal lobe which is responsible for uh, this uh, limb sensory functions so, then wernicke's area as i told you this area is responsible for mathematical ability and also language processing okay and also the language processing these are all then limbic association areas as i told you limbic system is a separate system okay when you see this limbic system uh, you can see inside the brain inside the temporal lobe there are some areas this is called as the this is called as amygdaloid body this is called as the amygdaloid body this is amygdaloid body this amygdaloid body is continuing as like a hippopotamus you know hippopotamus isn't it a long it, it will be with a long body like this okay so this is a that's why it's called as hippocampus that's why it's called as hippocampus so this hippocampus is continuing as a cingulate gyrus and then is coming and ending as a mammillary body here it is coming and ending as a mammillary body so these are all these uh, separate organs we put them under the limbic system we put them under the limbic system okay so this uh, we will see about the limbic system function as i told you uh, if you see here the limbic system uh, is uh, responsible for the emotional so uh, emotions of a person okay psychologically if you see there are many persons who are having uh, disturbance in their emotions and it can uh, the memory is also processed by the hippocampus so see when there is patient suffering with memory loss there are two types of memory loss short term memory loss and long term memory loss okay so this memory loss uh, short term memory loss the persons cannot remember the few uh, short memories okay they can remember the parents identify the parents friends and all these things but short uh, memory they cannot okay there are long term memory loss so like you know completely they will uh, the forget the past okay so all these emotional uh, impact and uh, memories all are ruled by this limbic system okay so these are the limbic system organs so the mammillary body amygdaloid body hippocampus and the cingulate gyrus okay so coming to lateralization of the cerebral cortex as i told you the left hand i mean the left brain is controlling the right body and the right brain is controlling the left body so if uh, your uh, right brain thinks anything this message is given to the left brain to this corpus callosum this is a visceral fibers this is the visceral see actually there are three types of fibers one is association fibers another is a commissural fibers and third is a projection fibers 
okay so uh, that's what i'm going to show you this picture if you there are this uh, the three, they are nothing but bunch of neurons they are nothing but bunch of neurons so what you see in this picture is this association fiber okay so uh, here you see this is uh, parietal lobe and this is a temporal lobe this is temporal lobe and this is a parietal lobe this is a parietal lobe okay so what happens now you are i am telling you to uh, stand up okay that information comes to this the temporal lobe okay now this association fibers they are connected between each sulcus and the gyrus like this the association fibers so this association fiber will take the message stand up to your parietal lobe now the parietal lobe will will tell to your left brain this is right and this okay so there is a mutual fiber this is the commutial fiber that is the corpus callosum so the right left to the right brain will tell to a left brain through the commutial fiber okay now both the right brain and left brain are speaking each other through the commutial fiber okay because first the association fiber told the parietal lobe now the parietal lobe told the other right brain also through the commutial fiber now both this parietal lobe will tell the information to your projection fibers that is the corticospinal tract i have shown you the picture through the tract the information goes to the spinal cord and the nerve is connected to the spinal cord to the muscle here okay so three types of fibers association fibers that is spreading the information between the lobes between the sulcus and the gyrus the commutial fibers that is spreading the information between the right brain and the left brain and the projection fibers that is bringing the message from the cerebral cortex towards the spinal cord and spinal, from the spinal cord the motor nerve is connected and through the motor nerve it goes the message goes to the muscle and the muscle works so these are the three different types of fibers note down association fibers commutial fibers and the projection fibers projection fibers are called as the pyramidal tract or the corticospinal tract okay so these are all the projection fibers okay and this is the commutial fibers that communicates between the right brain and the left brain through the corpus callosum and the association fibers that is communicating between each hemisphere that is communicating between the each hemisphere okay okay what you see here is a cut section of the brain what you see here is the cut section of the brain okay so what i i have just made a cut in the transverse cut of of the brain okay so what you see here is the cerebral cortex these are all the frontal lobe parietal lobe and the occipital lobe here okay then coming deep you have the white matter here you have the white matter in this region the white matter in this region so uh, from the cerebral cortex the fibers are coming this is called as internal capsule this is called as internal capsule okay and this is the external capsule this line is external capsule and here you have this basal ganglia okay you know the basal ganglia is you can call it as a motor relay center basal ganglia is called as the motor relay center it has four parts it has four parts okay sorry five parts okay one is the uh, globus pallidus other is the uh, uh, putamen then uh, another is the subthalamic nucleus and then you have the cordic nucleus okay these are the four parts and another one part is that's called as the uh, substantia nigra that is present in the brain stem that is present in the uh, brain stem the substantia nigra is present in the brain stem okay so what you see here at the center is the ventricle that is, is 
and you can see some filter that's called as a coplexus. This is what we call it as blood brain barriers. They only filter the CSF from the blood and drain into this ventricle and drain into this ventricle. At the center of the brain, you have this thalamus. Okay, this is a egg shaped structure. What you see here is the brain, and you know what? I have removed this. Uh, Okay, again from beginning, I'll come on. let me just okay. You can see now I have removed one hemisphere of the brain, so I will remove this dura mater fold also. Okay, now uh, you, what you have seen here is the ventricle. Let, you, let me keep the ventricle in the same place. So what you see here is these are the limbic system organs okay this is the hippocampus and this is the amygdaloid body this is the amygdaloid body okay this is the amygdaloid body and okay this is the hippocampus as i told you it is the main organ for the memory as well as the navigation ability okay so uh, you now if you don't have google map you will be able to go to your home the google map okay so that is the navigation ability okay this is one of the limbic system organ and this is the amygdaloid body which is responsible for emotions okay if any people are emotionally weak so this amygdaloid body is this is also one limbic system organ i'll remove that and i'll remove the hippocampus also okay so if you if you see this hippocampus it is continuing here as a cingulate gyrus and then the mammillary body and then the mammillary body so after i remove this basal ganglion organs these are all the basal ganglia structures okay so it has four parts one is this caudate nucleus okay which is responsible for controlling movements okay then uh, okay and the putamen putamen which is also responsible for uh, physical work for example pre procedural memories okay well, now you know how to do write in your notebook okay. this is a motor memory okay these are all this information are stored in the putamen so this pu caudate nucleus putamen and this is the basal ganglia structure and inside this you have the globus pallidus okay i'll i'll show you i'll remove this uh, ventricle for you okay okay and you see this is the this is the choroid plexus that is a filter that is present in the ventricle i will, we will discuss that separately okay now uh, okay this is the corpus callosum that is connecting the uh, both hemispheres this is the corpus callosum that is connecting now i will remove all these limbic organs as i told you this is the hippocampus and this is the uh, phronix and this is the body of the phronix and this comes in ends as a uh, uh, so i will remove this okay so now uh, at the center of the brain there is a two egg shaped structure that is called as a thalamus i don't want to touch the thalamus okay now i have shown you only the okay okay so these are the so i have shown you the basal ganglia the putamen and the caudate nucleus and the subthalamic nucleus all these are present deep inside deep inside okay so i will uh, come back so caudate nucleus putamen globus pallidus i will show the caudate nucleus and the putamen okay this globus Pallidus and the subthalamic nucleus, I will be showing you later, and also the substantia nigra because this is present deep in the deeper aspect of the brain. This is present in the deeper aspect of the brain. So if you see this, 
it receives the input from the cerebral cortex and other subcortical structures which are other. the output the nucleus projects to the premotor and the prefrontal cortex influence the muscle movement so as i told you this is something called as the motor signal processing center the basal ganglia is something called as motor signal processing center so let me show you one video it is uh, very uh, interesting to know about this um, that is called as hemibalismus okay you see what you see here is uh, there is involuntary and that involuntary movement uh, hand off okay you can see the this old patient is he is moving this uh, leg this is involuntary movement he is not moving this by his will okay it is moving without his control okay why because there is damage to the subthalamic nucleus okay so this movement stops only when he is sleeping only when he is sleeping so when he is awake he cannot control this movement okay you see all this movement it is taking place without his control that is important okay this is due to damage to the subthalamic nucleus in the basal ganglia by shaking without any control so okay. so there is same thing called as chorea hmm. i will try to find okay so there is uh, something called as chorea so this chorea is also associated with uh, the damage in this basal ganglion region okay so all the more for example if a person is getting epilepsy what is epilepsy it is a fit okay why he is getting epilepsy because he is unable to control the involuntary movement automatically brain is firing abnormal amount of impulse and that is reaching the muscle so he is unable to control the muscle contraction okay so it depends how abnormally which lobe the which lobe of the brain is abnormally working okay so this is what you have to understand the, the motor functions in the brain so then you have the uh, this basal ganglia filters or uh, filter out incorrect and inappropriate response okay that means what the basal ganglia only is uh, controlling the uh, motor movements for example as i told you huntington's chorea you can take the word huntington's chorea c h o r e a it is abnormal movement okay you can google it huntington's chorea that is due to damage in the basal ganglia and the parkinson's disease okay that is also due to damage in the substantia nigra of the basal ganglia this substantia nigra is present in the brain stem it is some sort of black substance that is present in the cerebral peduncle area that is releasing dopamine so when this the area is damaged and the dopamine is not released then the patient starts to uh, shiver i mean move, uh, shake his head and uh, neck so that is the parkinson's disease okay so let me show you a video of parkinson's disease okay so what you see here is uh, you can see the tremor of the hand okay you can see this is a old patient who has suffered uh, parkinson's disease you can see there is continuous tremor he, he cannot write okay but you can see the hand mm, there are motor movements we can see this is the this is the tremor we call it as tremor okay you can see the finger it is shaking and uh, when they write it shakes even the head also it will be shaking and uh, so what you see here is there is a patient with abnormal tongue movement then abnormal hand movement you see the hand movement doesn't she is not doing she it is involuntary movement okay she cannot control uh, this movement you can she cannot control this movement there is abnormal movement okay you see this is abnormal she is not doing okay this this movement comes abnormally okay so uh, this is called as huntington's chorea 
this is called as the huntington's chorea okay so this chorea uh, parkinson's disease hemibalismus all these are due to damage in the basal ganglionic structures of the brain due to damage in the basal ganglionic structures of the brain okay so uh, so you have to understand why abnormalities are behind it okay so let's go to the next topic uh, the huntington's disease and the parkinson's disease you understand due to damage in this basal ganglionic structures okay next let's go to the diencephalon which consists of thalamus hypothalamus and epithalamus okay you know when we remove you know 80% of the uh, intracranial cavity is occupied by cerebrum okay so now we remove the cerebrum in the cerebrum only we, we have this basal ganglia and all this stuff so at the center when we go we go to the thalamus we go to the thalamus so this thalamus is two x shaped structure this thalamus if you look at the center of the brain there is two x shaped structure some study says that there are um, uh, there are around 25 plus nucleus in thalamus okay the thalamus is the main relay center for all the sensory impulse the thalamus is the main relay center for all the sensory impulse okay so let me show you this thalamus in the 3d and you can show the uh, see okay so what you see here is the thalamus okay so as i told you this is one egg structure this is one egg shaped structure and the other egg shaped structure is here so let me remove the cerebral cortex of this region and also the basal ganglia and other place so that it will be clear for you to understand okay this is the limbic structures okay so this is the right thalamus and this is the left thalamus and the posterior part we call as epithalamus okay which is called as a pineal gland the hypothalamus is present below this the hypothalamus is present this area so let us see the various uh, both this egg structure is connected by a mass vasa intermedia is connected by <coughs> vasa intermedia so here as i told you the thalamus is having 25 plus nucleus so we will see a different part of thalamus this is the anterior area this is the anterior nucleus of thalamus and this is the anterior nucleus and this is the dorsal that is the upper aspect dorsal uh, nucleus of the thalamus and this is the posterior lateral posterior nucleus of the thalamus and this is the ventral posterior nucleus of the thalamus and this is the pulvin, pul pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus each and every area has certain functions we will discuss that here okay and this is the medial nucleus of the thalamus okay and this is the internal medullary lamina of the thalamus if, and this is the arcuate nucleus of the thalamus okay this is a okay so this is the internal medullary lamina lam of thalamus okay so what you have seen here is okay so what you see here is this is the medial nucleus of the thalamus okay so when you remove these we can see the third ventricle that is sitting in between these two thalamus the right thalamus and the left thalamus as i told you this thalamus is an egg shaped structure you have one egg in the right side and another egg in the left side okay in between you have this is a fibers that is connecting that's called as internal medullary lamina okay this lamina is connecting the right thalamus with the left thalamus okay and in between these two thalamus you have the third ventricle okay and
okay this is the actual thalamus okay so this is right complete left uh, thalamus and the right thalamus we have removed okay so these are various nucleus of the thalamus so now once i remove the thalamus you have the uh, hypothalamus structure you have the hypothalamus structure so this hypothalamus structure is this this hypothalamus structure is this okay this hypothalamus structure is this for example i will remove this okay okay you know this hypothalamus is just a small uh, area in this uh, this is the leg of the cerebrum the cerebral peduncle okay on the cerebral peduncle only you have the thalamus sitting on the thalamus you have the basal ganglia sitting on the basal ganglia you have various lobes of the brain are sitting so this uh, thalamus hypothalamus and the epithalamus is just in the posterior side i will show you the epithalamus so this is hypothalamus study says that this is only uh, 4 to 6 gram of tissue the study says that this hypothalamus weighs only 4 to 6 gram but it is doing it is responsible for all the vital functions in the body we will discuss that in the slide okay there are many vital functions that is responsible for by that is done by this uh, hypothalamus just only small four gram tissue so this is the right and hypothalamus tissue okay. so that is the pineal gland so for that i have to go back Okay. okay this ex posterior extension of the brain this posterior extension of the brain sorry of the thalamus is called as this epithalamus this small part is called as the epithalamus okay this epithalamus is a posterior extension which is also called as the pineal gland okay this pineal gland is secreting the melatonin and that is responsible for sleeping function okay for sleep the melatonin is very essential for you know there are many people who are suffering from insomnia that is without getting sleep okay this small piece of gland we call it pineal gland we call it as the epithalamus so this is thalamus epithalamus and hypothalamus is under this shape okay on the cerebral peduncle i have shown you okay uh, and this is the hypothalamus cerebral peduncle on the cerebral peduncle you have the hypothalamus okay so i have shown you so let's go back to the slide okay as i told you the diencephalon consists of thalamus the diencephalon consists of thalamus, hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. That is the pineal gland. Pineal gland. That is the pineal gland. Okay. So this is the egg, two egg-shaped structure in the center of the brain. So if you look at this, this is present in this location. This is the location of the thalamus gland. It's not a gland. It's a part of the brain. Diencephalon. Okay. So uh, you can see here, this is a epithalamus that consists of the pineal gland mainly. Okay, that consists of pineal gland mainly. And this area is the hypothalamus. This area is, it's a small area, but it is having a lot of vital functions. I will discuss in the next slide. Okay, and this is the thalamus, the shape structure. Okay, so... Uh, it is responsible for all the sensory signal processing okay i told you there are many different types of sensor, sensory function like 
taste, hearing, vision, touch, pain, okay, movement, kinesthetic sense, proprioceptive sense, different types of sense are there. Okay. So uh, now if you look, these are various types of nucleus. You have the dorsal nucleus as well as the ventral nucleus and the anterior nucleus and the posteriorly you have the pulvinar nucleus okay so the anterior nucleus is responsible for uh, sensory sensations the nucleus is responsible for motor activities and the corticular osseous function is by the pulvinar nucleus okay so the, these are different types of senses for example sensations motor activities and Particular also learning, memory, okay, many different type of functions are there for the thalamus. We will discuss one by one. Okay, so as I told you, the hypothalamus, which is weighing only four to six gram of tissues in the cerebral peduncle, it has many different functions. Okay, it's a major homeostatic regulator. It is major homeostatic regulator. Okay, uh, if you look. Uh, the hypothalamus this if you look at the picture of the hypothalamus um, okay so i will show you the continuation of the hypothalamus that is a pituitary gland we will discuss that separately okay so it is the hypothalamus is maintaining the osmotic pressure glucose level in the body hormone concentrations and temperature that's what we are going to see one by one okay so this hypothalamus is controlled in the complete autonomic nervous system okay autonomic nervous system means it is controlling the heart stomach kidneys liver intestines all these organ functions so all the visceral organ functions are controlled by hypothalamus number one then control of endocrine system function as i told you see this is a pituitary gland and this is a pituitary stalk. This stalk ends in the hypothalamus. Okay. So what happens? The hypothalamus releases the hormone that reaches the pituitary gland. Then pituitary gland releases the hormone that reaches the other gland. Okay. It reaches like thyroid gland. So hypothalamus tell the pituitary to work. Pituitary tell the thyroid to work. Okay, so ultimately the hypothalamus that's a small tissue that is controlling the complete hormonal function because pituitary is boss of all gland, all endocrine gland is controlled by pituitary gland. When boss is in problem, complete endocrine glands in the body is in problem. Okay, so next, <clears throat> initiate physical response to emotions. So hypothalamus is controlling your emotions. Then regulate body temperature. <clears throat> well, the normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> so there are thermoregulator cells okay, in the uh, hypothalamus. So if there is excess body temperature, the hypothalamus will activate the autonomic nervous system and makes your body to sweat. Okay, If there is low body temperature, the hypothalamus will activate the autonomic nervous system and make the skeletal muscle to contract and shiver so the body temperature increases so the complete body temperatures maintenance is done by the hypothalamus regular food intake okay you might have seen in the hospital some patients suddenly they stop eating you might have seen some patients suddenly they stop eating so what happens here so when they stop eating we call it as uh, anorexia okay loss of appetite so that is due to improper function of the hypothalamus that is due to improper function of the hypothalamus then regulate water balance and thirst so the thirst center is controlled by the hypothalamus which acts uh, the antidiuretic hormone of the <coughs> body okay then sleep wake cycle so that is a circadian rhythm we call it as circadian rhythm is controlled by the hypothalamus okay so you many people they have the habit of waking at five o'clock so every day from small childhood when they practice automatically they wake up at five o'clock and their sleep goes vanishes okay 
So this kind of sleep wake cycle is uh, controlled by the hypothalamus. So as I told you, the small hypothalamus is having so many functions. Okay. So as I told you, this is the hypothalamus area, and this hypothalamus extends as a uh, pituitary stalk this and to this stalk the pituitary gland is connected pituitary gland is connected so what happens the hormone that is secreted here comes to the stalk and reaches a pituitary gland so hypothalamus is directly controlling the pituitary and the pituitary is directly controlling all the uh, other glands pituitary is directly controlling all the other glands okay now um, uh, pineal gland you see this pineal gland is called as the epithalamus this pineal gland is called as epithalamus as I told you this pineal is releasing the hormone called melatonin that is responsible for inducing sleep signals okay so when you are asleep you might observe all the skeletal muscles will start to relax and you cannot uh, move the skeletal muscle sometimes when you want to wake up, uh, you, your brain becomes active, but skeletal muscle is not ready. Okay, so that is due to uh, like uh, this melatonin that is inducing this sleep signals in the body. Okay, next we'll go to the brain stem that consists of mid, mid brain, pons, and middle oblongata. Coming to the brain stem, we will see in this objective about the midbrain, pons, and the middle oblongata. Okay, actually, this is the junction like the cerebral peduncle, the leg of the cerebrum. Okay, from the cerebrum till the spinal cord, we are going to discuss about the importance of this part. Okay. So, here in this picture, you can see in the super aspect, uh, what you see here is, uh, this is the two thalamus, right thalamus and the left thalamus. And in this, this area, till this area, we are going to study now. Okay, the midbrain, the pons and the medulla oblongata okay these are the three regions we are going to discuss in this objective these are the three regions we are going to discuss in this objective so coming here uh, in this region there is a midbrain which acts as a reflex center for some of the visual and auditory stimulus okay okay so what you see here is the cerebral, this is the pons and this area is the middle oblongata. This area is the middle oblongata and here you have this cerebral peduncle, okay, cerebral peduncle. So now I take one side of the cerebral peduncle out and I, I can show you here. So this area, which is called as a black substance, we call it as substantia nigra, and they see the dopamine. Okay, when there is uh, less dopamine, um, then there is tremors. Okay, you would have seen this in the previous video about the Parkinson's disease. Okay, above this substantia nigra, you have a small subthalamic nucleus in which the damage to the subthalamic nucleus leads to hemipalismus. In the same previous video I have shown you, there is abnormal movement in the leg and sometimes in the hand also in one half of the body. Okay, that is due to damage to this. Both the, both these areas belong to the basal ganglia, which is for, for motor control. Okay, but here, you see, this is the cerebral peduncle, which is also called as midbrain area. So there you can see there are two bulges in the right side and two bulge in the left side. So for this I will, uh, I will try to remove from all this part and I will try to show you. I have removed both the cerebral hemisphere 
and I will remove the cerebellum also. Okay, I have removed both cerebellum. So here, what you see is this uh, four bulge. This is called as carpora quadrigemina. Okay, below this is present below the thalamus. This is present below the thalamus. So this is the superior colliculi, and this both this bulge are called as superior colliculi, and both this bulge are inferior colliculi. If you trace the superior colliculi, this superior colliculi is connected to this hypothalamus. To this hypothalamus, I want to I will remove this limbic system organs and the ventricles here. Okay, and this is a thalamus and this is the uh, cerebral peduncle. So here you can see uh, in the anterior side you have this uh, optic tract. You have this optic tract. Okay, this is the optic nerve, and both the optic nerve right and the optic nerve comes and joins to form optic chiasma. This is the optic chiasma. Okay, so this optic chiasma. It come this optic nerve fibers. It comes all the way in this area, and then comes and joins to this superior colliculi here. Okay, to this region, they come and join. So this superior colliculi is responsible for visual reflex, and the inferior colliculi is responsible for auditory reflex. The auditory uh, nerve, that is the um, vestibulocochlear nerve fibers, they come and end in this inferior colliculi okay they they are responsible for auditory reflex okay so this is how this uh, carpora quadrigemina is formed in the posterior aspect of the cerebral peduncle this is how the carpora quadrigemina is formed in the posterior aspect of the cerebral peduncle so coming back here so this is how the uh, Posterior aspect of the cerebral peduncle is present. Okay, so these, these are the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. These are the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. Collectively, four of them are called as carpora quadrigemina that we will see. So, they, as I told you, they are responsible for this uh, reflex and for visual and auditory stimulus. Okay, below the, the pons, which is having the respiratory center and below pons you have the uh, cardiac center okay so the brain stem is responsible for eye movement regulation of autonomic function respiration heart rate blood pressure and digestion so we will see that more clearly as i told you in the pons in, the, in this area you know uh, you, in the brain you have to know that there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves okay cranial means these nerves they origin inside the cranium that's why we give the name as cranial nerves okay so olfactory optic oculomotor trochlear trigeminal abducens facial vestibular cochlear glossopharyngeal vagus accessory and hypoglossal these are the 12 cranial nerves in the order so this first cranial nerve the olfactory and the oculomotor uh, optic nerve, the olfactory and the optic nerve, they end in the cerebral hemisphere itself. Okay, their fibers are present in the cerebral parental level. But the oculomotor to hypoglossal, all these nerves, they originate in this, they have the nucleus in these regions. Okay, especially in the pons and the middle oblongate. You can see all these are the cranial nerves which have the nucleus in this region in, in the pons and middle oblongata and thereby all the important nerves are derived in this region i mean the output is coming from this region okay important remaining 12 uh, 10 pairs of cranial nerves okay that is why this is associated with 10 cranial nerves out of 12 10 cranial nerves we will see when I am teaching the cranial nerves, I will explain you in detail about the cranial nerve. Just know that this area is giving uh, origin uh, point for all the important cranial nerves except two. Okay. Then coming to this uh, uh, ventrally, I mean <coughs> anteriorly, 
there are two cerebral peduncles okay in superior aspect there is leg peduncle means leg okay so inside cerebral peduncle only you have this uh, 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 the cerebral aqueduct okay the cerebral aqueduct is a very narrow tube that is connecting third ventricle to fourth ventricle okay this is called a cerebral aqueduct it is a very narrow tube in case if there is any block that happens in the csf circulation the cerebral aqueduct is more prone for block because this cerebral aqueduct is a very narrow tube that is connecting the third ventricle to fourth ventricle so uh, in the cerebral peduncle you have four bulge in the posterior aspect that's called as corpora quadrigemina in that the superior two bulge is called a superior colliculi which is responsible for visual reflex and the inferior two bulge is called as the inferior colliculi which is responsible for auditory reflex which is responsible for auditory reflex and this is the topmost cut section you can see uh, and moreover why the pons is bulged for example if you see the brain stem this is a brain stem this is a pons and this is middle of lung this is how the pons is present okay so what have, you can see a lot of uh, bulge in this area so this from the cerebral cortex from the cerebral cortex the pyramidal tract that is the corticospinal tract is coming here the corticospinal tract is coming here okay and then the posterior side you have the cerebellum you have the cerebellum here you have the cerebellum here so what happens this pons this pons acts as a bridge between these neurons okay so these new nerve fibers they act as a bridge they come and communicate this is a communication junction all the neurons come here and they communicate between the cerebellum cerebellum and also the spinal cord so this is why more amount of nerve fibers are present and uh, upper motor neuron tracts are present and that's why there is a bulging of this pons there is bulging of this pons you can see these are all the pyramidal tracts that is the projection fibers that is the corticospinal tract okay that is running in the pons so and moreover this pons is a junction where the decussion takes place in the previous slides i have shown you fibers that is coming from the cerebral cortex and then uh, it is coming to the oppo the fibers are decussating to the opposite side i mean left side brain fibers is going to right spinal cord and few amount of fibers are coming to the same side okay likewise right side brain fibers comes to the left side uh, spinal cord and few amount of uh, fibers come to the left side so 85 percent of the fibers decussation is taking place in the pons in this region that is why when there is damage to the right side brain the left side body gets paralyzed when there is the damage to the left side brain the right side body gets paralyzed okay if a person is having paralysis of the right side of the body the problem will be in the left side of the brain okay if the person patient is having uh, right hemiplegia the patient will have left brain damage okay so due to decussation of this corticospinal tract in the uh, in this region okay so coming here coming here uh, and you see <coughs> this is the dorsal side and this is the ventral side dorsal side and ventral side and you have the cerebral aqueduct that is passing through this that is passing through this uh, I, I would have shown i think would have shown uh, you would have seen in the uh, previous uh, animations so likewise you have the uh, this is a third granular nucleus is present okay then uh, red nucleus is present substantia nigra the black substance that produces that secretes dopamine okay for the muscle coordination that is also present in the cerebral peduncle level okay next when we cut little when we go down as i told you the, here you have the substantia nigra and the red nucleus they are mainly 
producing neurotransmitter called dopamine they are producing the neurotransmitter substance called as the dopamine so the do they are the dopamine releasing neurons actually they are appearing black in color because during neural tube formation the melanin pigment from the neural tube they come and migrate and sit in the cerebral peduncle and that's why the substantia nigra is appearing black in color okay we call that as black substance we call that as black substance then coming to the red nucleus it is the area where there is high vascular supply which consists of iron pigment and uh, uh, they are the uh, relay centers of ascending uh, sorry descending motor pathways as i told you in the spinal cord you have ascending tracts as well as descending tracts ascending tracts takes motor signals to the brain and descending tracts uh, bring the sensory uh, uh, I mean, descending tracks, they bring the motor uh, impulse from the brain and spinal cord to, uh, from the brain, whereas ascending tracks, they take the sensory impulse, okay? So, for example, here, this is the point, the red nucleus is the place where the relay center, uh, it is acting as a relay, and this is the place where the decusation of the nerve fibers are taking place, okay? The crossing of right fibers and the left fibers, okay? And moreover, in the pons, the fourth ventricle is located. The fourth ventricle is located, and uh, it is acting as a junction between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. And more amount of pineal nerves originate in this area. Okay, and they have the breathing center. They have the respiratory center in the pons. Okay, they have the respiratory center. Here you can see the uh, fourth ventricle. You can see the fourth ventricle. These are all the pyramidal tracts that is the projection fibers that is coming from the cerebral cortex okay and apart from this there is a nerve origin the trigeminal nerve as i told you more number of cranial nerves originate from the the nucleus this is the nerve nucleus okay from this is this is the place where the uh, impulse is generated and comes all the way through the nerve for example trigeminal nerve is bringing the sensory impulse from the face facial region okay. so all the nerves brings a sensory impulse to this nucleus then the brain will decide what to do if there is a decayed tooth your tooth uh, if you have dental caries severe amount of pain comes to the trigeminal nerve and trigeminal nerve is said to be the thickest cranial nerve okay fine so Coming to the central canal, so the central canal is a continuation of the fourth ventricle. The central canal is a continuation of fourth ventricle and the central canal passes all the way down at the center of the spinal cord. Okay, the spinal cord is ending at the L2 uh, vertebra, upper border of L2 vertebra. So the central canal continues till that region in the center of the spinal cord. Okay, taking the... Uh, conducting the cerebrospinal fluid through the hole okay so now the uh, pyramidal tracts that is the corticospinal tract is present in the ventral side okay then inferior cerebral cerebellar peduncles okay that is connected to the uh, uh, medulla the uh, dorsal side that is the posterior side so so the swelling of the medulla oblongata we call it as the olive nucleus okay so they are uh, the the stretch informations of the muscles are and the joints are taken to the cerebellum through this olive nucleus as i told you cerebellum is just a uh, is a main part that is controlling the body balance and posture we will discuss about that okay we will discuss about that okay so this is a cut section in the fourth ventricular level exactly in the uh, ending of the, I mean, in the middle oblongata level. Okay, so coming to the middle oblongata, the cardiac cardiac center uh, is present in the middle oblongata, and you know, if the heart is beating fast, the BP is increasing. Okay, so there are some baroreceptor cells that senses the blood pressure and controls the heart rate accordingly. Okay, so we call that as a vasomotor centers. Okay, then respiratory centers that is little bit high, uh, that is uh, between the pons and middle of the you have the respiratory centers. So that is 
controlling the rate of respiration normally 12 to 14 is uh, respiratory rate okay whereas for a female 16 to 18 new one it is 20 to 22 breaths per minute okay so this respiratory rate is controlled speed of the respiratory rate is controlled by these uh, centers okay and also the other centers like vomiting other centers like vomiting then coughing hiccups swallowing and sneezing all the centers are present in this pons and the middle oblongata okay all the centers are you know all these uh, functions are very important okay if suppose if uh, the food in the stomach is more uh, more alkaline then you warm it okay that is the middle oblongata has to decide whether to throw out or to keep in the stomach okay or suppose if any foreign body goes inside the respiratory tract you have to cough and take out so the middle oblongata is deciding whether you have to cough or you by getting the cough reflex okay then hiccups you know there are many theories for hiccups okay if you look at the newborn baby the baby keep, keeps getting a hiccup so they say that you know the stomach is developing that is why the hiccup is present okay sometimes you know when uh, there is more uh, oxygenation then also hiccups will uh, uh, occur so these are all the natural phenomena where you are able to control the respiration and increase the carbon dioxide level in the blood okay then swallowing the deglutition center okay you know what to when to swallow when to breathe stop breathing so you know you always stop breathing when you swallow the food you should have observed this. you never breathe parallelly and swallow parallelly that leads to severe disaster cough okay so aspiration it leads to aspiration that is the foreign food foreign body that is the food material will go into the respiratory tract and severe amount of cough reflex will uh, develop the sneezing as like i told if any foreign body any dust sits in your uh, nasal mucosa you sneeze okay so all these are the functions that is controlled by the middle of lungata also the functions that are controlled by the middle of lungata let's go to the cerebellum cerebellum you see cerebellum is present in the posterior cranial fossa so uh, we have to in this objective we have to describe the structure and functions of the cerebellum we have to describe the structure and functions of the cerebellum okay and this, this what you see here is the posterior side of the brain the cerebellum is called as the hind brain the cerebellum is called as hind brain you have the right cerebellum and the left cerebellum you have the right cerebellum and the actually this is the anterior view this is the anterior view okay this is the right cerebellum and this is the left cerebellum so we will uh, turn the cerebellum and we will see here okay, so this is the posterior lobe so i will cut one half of the cerebellum so that it will be easy to understand so this is the actual uh, cerebellum you see the pons is located here pons is located here and the cerebellum is located in the posterior aspect so this is a cut section okay so if you look at the lobes of the cerebellum you have the posterior lobe you have the posterior lobe you have the posterior lobe and you have the uh, anterior lobe this is the anterior lobe and this is the posterior lobe so the whole uh, lobes of cerebellum is located in the posterior cranial fossa in the cranium okay so the posterior cranial fossa accommodates above the cerebellum you have the tent like uh, fold of the dura mater which is called as uh, tentorium cerebri uh, cerebral uh, cerebral line so this is present as a tent between junction uh, tent between the cerebrum and the cerebellum okay so if you look here this is anterior lobe and this is a posterior lobe and this uh, center uh, fibers we call it as a 
vermis of cerebellum so if you look here there are some uh, arbor with this fibers are called as arbor vitae okay these fibers are called as arbor vitae and you see this projection is the fourth ventricle this is the fourth ventricle and this is called as a medial aperture this is called as the medial aperture okay so uh, if you if you see here this is the fourth ventricle and this is the lateral aperture and this opening is called lateral aperture and this is the medial aperture this aperture is called as foramen monro and foramen megendi and foramen lusca is present the interventric foramen is called as foramen monro monro and these two hold the medial and lateral aperture is called as a foramen megendi and foramen lusca okay so this is other name okay see for uh, you to remember just remember as medial two lateral aperture and one medial aperture which is communicating to the subarachnoid space to distribute the csf around the whole brain and spinal cord so when i teach the meninges and the csf circulation you will understand that okay so for time being uh, keep in mind that this full fourth ventricle is located in the pons and posterior side you have this cerebellum posterior to that you have the cerebellum so this uh, uh, spread uh, spreading of this nerve fiber we call it as arbor vitae spreading of this nerve fiber is called as arbor vitae so when you look at the uh, arterial supply when you look at the blood supply the, you have the cerebellar arteries you have the cerebral arteries that is branching from the vertebral that is branching from the vertebral artery that is branching from the vertebral artery so okay so these are the uh, cerebellar arteries these are the cerebellar arteries and these arteries originate from the uh, vertebro basilary artery these are arteries they originate from the vertebro basilary artery okay so you see the vertebro basilary artery is coming it's a union of right vertebral artery and the left vertebral artery and it forms a vertebro basilary artery so, so the first branch of the vertebro basilary artery is this cerebral artery okay is this uh, cerebral artery okay so this is how the cerebellum is getting blood supply this is how the cerebellum is getting blood supply okay so arterial circulation we will discuss that separately because that is a big, big uh, network of blood vessels you have to understand in a technical way then only it is easy to understand for us okay so we don't want to focus that in focus blood supply to the brain now okay so now when you see let's go back to the slide and to see the other functions to see the other functions okay if you come to this cross sectional cerebellum as i told you this this part this part is the fourth ventricle this part is the fourth ventricle and inside the fourth ventricle you have the filter like substance called as the choroid blood cells which is called as blood brain barrier okay which is made up of ependymal cells and the astrocyte cells okay so here you have the now fibers we call that uh, nerve fiber distribution as arbor vitae okay so and you have the anterior lobe here and the posterior lobe here and this is the small flocco nodular lobe this is called as a flocco nodular lobe so what happens this pons here uh, when it, it it acts as a bridge it acts as a bridge so because the nerve fibers from cerebral cortex comes here the nerve fibers from the spinal cord comes here and the nerve fibers from the cerebellum it comes all the way to this pons it comes all the way to this pons it comes all the way to this pons so this area is called as the junction that is the bridge communication bridge between these three cells let's say the, there is more amount of nerve fibers in the pons and you can see the swelling of the pons in this region you can see the swelling of the pons in this region okay so 
if you see this is a cut specimen of the cerebellum so you can see the nerve fibers that is distributed like a cauliflower appearance okay so it's called as a arborvitae this we call that as arborvitae okay next if you see uh, there is white matter inside and gray matter outside for the cerebellum the white matter of cerebellum composed of short and long tracks okay long tracks enter and leave the cerebellum through three pairs of uh, peduncles the inferior cerebral peduncle it carries sensory information uh, to the cerebellum okay so, you know mm, there are uh, kinesthetic sense and the uh, proprioceptive sense what is kinesthetic sense suppose when the uh, tibia is moving on, sorry femur is moving on the tibia in the joint so naturally you feel the movement that is the kinesthetic sensation whereas you stand up you stand up from sitting position to standing position when you stand up from sitting position to standing position the femur is pressing the tibial articulating surface so there what happens naturally the pressure goes to the tibial plateau so now that is called there are receptor cells called as proprioceptive receptors so these receptors sense that you are standing and it uh, uh, sends the signals to the brain okay so this is called as proprioceptive sense okay whereas the vestibular nucleus see if you see the seventh cranial nerve, i mean uh, the vestibular cochlear nerve eighth cranial nerve the vestibular cochlear nerve so this nucleus is present in the cerebellum and this is the place where you um, are able to maintain the balance and equilibrium of the body okay suppose when you are in the water you know that whether you are in the upside down position or in the standing position so this is how the, the there are some fluid uh, dynamics that is present in the vestibular cochlear apparatus that sends the signals to the cerebellum and you are able to know that you are able to balance and uh, the body and keep the body in proper equilibrium so when there is uh, too much of alcohol consumption what happens this function is suppressed and the person is unable to stand in a proper way and the person is unable to stand in a proper way so that's why the cerebellum at the uh, finally it is responsible for posture and uh, coordination i mean body balance and posture control like planning and coordination of this skeletal muscle works okay so the middle cerebellar peduncles entirely into the cerebellum from pons so the superior cerebral peduncle composed principally of tracks from the dentate nucleus in the cerebrum to red nucleus uh, then uh, it is uh, mainly responsible for motor area of the cerebral cortex so as i told you just uh, uh, the this red nucleus dentate nucleus all these are the fibers that is connecting be between the pyramidal tract and the fiber uh, fibers from the cerebellum okay so at the end the cerebral cortex uh, uh, act with the cerebral cortex to produce skilled movements okay like skilled movements for example you are uh, writing with your pen that is also a skilled movement okay you are walking with uh, high heels that is also a uh, skilled movement that is with the coordination of uh, leg skeletal muscles in the leg okay so else posture control okay like position sitting position and standing position all these are controlled by the skeletal muscles thereby body is able to maintain the balance okay so these are all various functions of the cerebellum you have to understand okay next coming to the limbic system i have previously told the showed you the limbic organs that is embedded inside the cerebral hemispheres okay so if you look at this uh, limbic system parts uh, there are four four main parts one is the uh, amygdaloid body cingulate gyrus then you have this uh, hippocampus and the mammillary body okay 
so i have to show this structures to you uh, okay if you look at the limbic system here if you i have to remove some of the brain structures okay so here what you can see here is the ventricles that is present in uh, right hemisphere i will remove the ventricle and this is the uh, fox let it let that be in place okay so in the temporal lobe inside deep inside the temporal lobe you have this hippocampus okay this is the shape of a hippo you know the hippocampus um, this is the shape of the hippo okay this is the shape of the hippo this is present inside the temporal lobe okay and here you have uh, amygdaloid body this is the amygdaloid body this is the amygdaloid body so the main function of this amygdaloid body is to uh, uh, have the memory of emotions okay and whereas the function of the hippocampus is to have a navigation ability okay for example uh, uh, if uh, you don't have google map now you all know without google map how to reach your home when you are driving a car you don't see the map you just know the road you just keep driving okay so these are all the navigation ability okay this kind of hippocampus is highly advanced for the birds migrating birds you know they fly 5000 8000 kilometers many 1000 kilometers then next year same place uh, they come and they breed and they again go back so these are all the navigation ability okay so the hippocampus they it's very sh highly functional for them but humans we also have the same na navigation ability but because of technology we use uh, uh, maps okay but otherwise in those days there is no before 20 years or uh, 15 years there is no google map there is no waze map nothing so people know by by navigation ability okay so this navigation ability is done by this hippocampus okay moreover uh, this hippocampus continues as a phonics okay it continues as a phonics okay so this hippocampus is continuing as a phonics it, it runs between the thalamus it runs the between the thalamus and finally it goes and ends as a mammillary body this is the mammillary body which is responsible for em emotions behavior and recognition of sensations okay all these organs that is the amygdaloid body hippocampus phonics cingulate gyrus it's uh, then in this mammillary body all these organs belongs to the limbic system of the brain okay we categorize them as limbic system categories on as limbic system okay so if you see here the uh, limbic system it has a emotional control okay that is done by the amygdaloid body and the cingulate gyrus and uh, it, the hippocampus plays a memory in the navigation ability okay and these are all the various organs that you have seen in the this model okay so uh, the cingulate gyrus the amygdaloid body hippocampus then the mammillary body all these are the important part of the limbic system okay so coming to the overview of the functions of the major part of the brain so there is cortex gray matter and the basal nucleus if you look at this uh, all these functions in the cerebral hemisphere the voluntary control then visual input then emotional intelligence processing then the basal nucleus you have the motor centers the description muscle movement centers okay then apart from this the thalamus function 
major function of thalamus is the sensory relay center okay hypothalamus you know many many we, we have discussed the autonomic nervous system control temperature food intake water balance thirst hormonal control then uh, positive hormones then uh, autonomic nerve functions so you know this hypothalamus is just a small piece of brain which is 4 to 6 gram of tissue but it has so many functions okay for example one if this temperature is not controlled what happened due to more metabolism continuous heat energy is produced and you die within four minutes within uh, four to five minutes you will die okay so if there is more temperature then uh, your kidney releases urine along with the urine the heat energy goes you get sweating along with sweat the heat energy goes okay so this kind of regulations like emotional regulation six drives all these are done by the hypothalamus okay then the limbic system you know as i told you emotion processing navigation abilities and all this stuff they belong to the limbic system okay then midbrain <coughs> in the midbrain the visual uh, reflex auditory reflex then the uh, substantia nigra and the red nucleus is present at the cranial nerve origin okay then uh, fibers pyramidal tracts that pass through midbrain then pons, it's acting as a relay center for all between the cerebrum cerebellum and spinal cord okay, then uh, cranial nerve origin point respiratory center and also bo uh, projection fibers middle of langata it consists of uh, decussation of fibers continuous projection fibers then cranial nerve it gives place for uh, cranial nerve origin then respiratory center vomiting center coughing center so these are all the summary of functions okay so just you can and uh, go through it and know this is what we have been discussing in the previous part okay let's go to the uh, next uh, objective the csf Yes, in this objective, we will discuss about the cerebrospinal fluid circulation, then uh, the lineages. So, you will understand how the cerebrospinal fluid is produced and how it is circulated and how the CSF is distributed around the brain as well as the spinal cord. So, to understand the CSF fluid, you have to understand about the meninges as well as the ventricles in the brain. So the ventricles in the brain we have discussed in the previous lecture. Okay, the lateral two lateral ventricles, one third ventricle and the fourth ventricle that is connected each other by interventricular foramen and the cerebral aqueduct. Okay. Now you will we will discuss about the meninges different layers of meninges these are nothing but the connective tissue okay that is safeguarding the whole brain as well as the spinal cord okay so coming in here uh, when we speak about this uh, cerebral protection to the brain and spinal cord that is uh, bony protection that is the calvarium and the vertebral column both the skull and the vertebral column is protecting the whole and whole brain and spinal cord. Inside to that, you have the meninges. Okay, that is three layers of membranes that is covering the whole brain and the spinal cord. Okay, so uh, uh, this membrane is covering the whole brain and spinal cord and it is giving adequate protection. So we will discuss about each and every membrane. Then the cushion effect of the spinal fluid, the cushion effect of the spinal fluid. Uh, what is this cushion effect? As I told you, like uh, the whole and brain and spinal cord is just floating on a fluid. That is how you can imagine. Okay. Suppose you take a beaker of water, put a ball in the water the ball goes in and comes out and it floats okay so likewise in this mechanism the whole brain and spinal cord is floating on a fluid that is a cerebrospinal fluid okay 
so if you now to discuss about the meninges it is a three different type in uh, different layers of connective tissues that is covering the whole brain and spinal cord whole brain and spinal cord and it protects blood vessels and encloses venous sinuses contains cs of fluid forms partition in the skull okay so to understand this let us go to the next slide okay here what you see this is the skin okay the scalp the scalp this is the scalp this scalp itself has five layers okay skin subcutaneous tissue aponeurosis loose areola tissue and pericranium these are the five layers of tissues that is present in the scalp once the scalp is removed okay you have the skull bone okay this skull bones are flat bones okay you have the front the osteology would have studied flat uh, frontal bone parietal lobe temporal bone occipital bone all this one. it's very strong structure in fact so these under this you have two layers of dura mater so all these three the dura arachna and the pyramid called as meninges okay so the dura mater itself has two layers the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer okay so the periosteal layer for example this is the skull this is the skull okay so the periosteal uh, dura mater is ending in the inside the skull is ending inside the skull whereas the meningeal dura mater the meningeal dura mater it is covering the whole brain as well as this spinal cord as well as the spinal cord okay so this um, meningeal dura mater it is forming it is folding between the two cerebral hemisphere and also the two cerebellum and also two cerebellum that we will discuss you can see see this is the periosteal layer okay periosteal dura mater and this is a meningeal dura mater this meningeal dura mater is folding here between the two cerebral hemisphere okay we will discuss that then below that you have a transparent membrane you have a very transparent membrane that is the arachnoid matter that is arachnoid matter and this pia matter is nothing but it is just sticking on the surface of the cerebrum okay the whole brain and spinal cord it is not a separate membrane actually the pia matter is not a separate membrane it is just sticking sticking to the so that that means your pyometer is going in the sulcus as well as coming in the gyrus it is going in the sulcus like this and it is coming in the gyrus like this okay so this is how the uh, uh, the layers of the meninges is arranged so now we are going to have a complete look uh, uh, outside look around this uh, Uh, dura mater yes what you see here is the skull okay and the vertebral column what you see here is the skull and the vertebral column so <coughs> yes this is the place where the brain and spinal cord is located well the complete brain and spinal cord is located so this is the cranial cavity this is the cranial cavity where you can see this the the inner area this is the cranial cavity and this is the spinal cavity the spinal cavity you can see uh, inside the space the foramen the vertebral foramen that is running in the center we call it as a spinal cavity okay so now if you have this uh, nervous tissues here if you have this nervous tissue here the whole brain as well as the spinal cord is coming all the way in this region okay so now uh, well, how you going to understand here is 
uh, I will uh, remove this skull. I will remove the skull in here. I will remove the skull in here. And here you see the full. This is the pineal dura matter. Okay. Periosteal dura matter. Okay. Then when I remove this pineal dura matter, you have the meningeal dura matter. This is the meningeal dura matter of the spinal cord, and this is the meningeal uh, uh, dura matter of the not. <coughs> this is the okay. This is this is the pineal dura okay. So this is the cranial dura matter and this is the spinal dura matter. So what happens here? This is the fold between. This is the fold of the dura matter. Let us see how it expands. So what I'll do is to understand this fold of this dura matter. I have to remove the cranial dura matter, and then I will remove the arachnoid dura matter and this is the pia matter the pia matter is just a membrane on the uh, surface of the cerebrum okay so pia matter is not a separate membrane so if you see here you can see uh, this is the this is the brain okay this is called as Fox cerebri, the fold between the two right and the left hemisphere. Okay, so this tip of the Fox cerebri, this tip of the Fox cerebri is attached to the crystal gallery of the ethmoid bone. Is attached to crystal gallery of the ethmoid bone, and this goes between these two right and the left hemisphere. Okay, then this is the fox cerebral line okay this is the cerebellum right cerebellum left cerebellum in between the right and the left cerebellum you have this fox cerebral line between the two cerebellum okay and this extension is called as the tentorium cerebral line okay on the cerebellum you have a tent like membrane okay so this is the tentorium cerebral okay so now why this fold has to take place in between these loops okay when you look at this arterial circulation when you look at the arterial circulation you see there are around 900 ml of blood is just flowing into the brain into the cranial cavity every minute okay so this is arterial blood supply to the intracranial structures whereas those blood has to return back okay so there is no veins like this uh, in the inside the cranium like you have this anterior cerebral artery middle cerebral artery and all this stuff okay so likewise there are no veins there are veins small veins but the main veins are absent the anterior cerebral veins are absent so these venous blood are draining as a pool of sinus okay they are draining into the pool of sinus that is present that is made by this fold of this dura mater okay so the meningeal dura mater so i will show the veins in here okay so you can see this is the superior sagittal sinus and this is the inferior sagittal sinus this is the inferior sagittal sinus okay and i will remove this okay you see this is the superior sagittal sinus and this is the inferior sagittal sinus and this is the straight sinus and this is transverse sinus in the right side and left side and this is the occipital sinus both this finally this is the sigmoid sinus 
and they come and end in the jugular vein like this they come and end jugular vein like this okay so now i will isolate these sinus you see these are the now these are not venous blood vessels they are just the sinus okay the blood is draining in this sinus and that blood is collected all the way in this junction and through the transverse sinus it comes to the sigmoid sinus here and this is called as a jugular bulb this is called as jugular bulb this jugular bulb opens in the jugular foramen in the base of the skull and finally it goes to the internal jugular vein internal jugular vein and this internal jugular vein opens into the subclavian vein okay this is how the venous blood from the cranium is draining back into the heart okay so this pool of blood runs in the fold of this venous sinus in the fold of this meninges in the folds of this meninges so this is where you have to understand the dural venous sinus that is running between the uh, dural venous sinus fold so you have to know the importance of fox cerebri you have to know the importance of fox cerebri you have to know the importance of this cranial uh, dura mater then the fox cerebri tentorium cerebelli this is the temporal tentorium cerebelli and this is a fox cerebelli okay But the first kilometer that gives room for dual venous sinus. Now, if you look at this uh, slide, you will be able to understand. You will be able to understand. Okay. Now, if you see here, the whole brain and spinal cord. Uh, I mean, the the whole brain and spinal cord is covered by the dura mater. It's covered by dura mater. Okay. You see here. This is the end. Okay, this this dura mater comes and ends as a phylum terminal. This is a, a ligamentous structures. Okay, this dura mater comes all the way up to the sacral vertebra, a sole vertebra. From the sacral vertebra, a thin thin thread thread like structures comes and attaches to the tip of the coccyx here. It attaches to the tip of the cos. It is called as the phylum terminal. Okay, this thread, end of this thread is called as the phylum terminal. Now, if you go back to the intervertebral foramen, you see this dura mater is extending outside. It is spreading outside to the intervertebral foramen. They are called as a thecal sac. Okay. Sometimes, if there is narrowing of the intervertebral foramen, if there is narrowing of the intervertebral foramen. If there is narrowing of the intervertebral foramen, if there is narrowing of the intervertebral foramen, so what happens? This causes irritation to the thecal sac and it leads to inflammation and radiating pain. Okay. Wherever this nerve goes, there is radiating. Okay, so this thecal sac irritation is common in degenerative disc disease here. Okay, so all you have to understand is the spinal cord is ending up to L2 vertebra. Okay, this level of the spinal cord is I will show you the level of the spinal cord. It is ending in the L2 upper vertebra border. It is ending. This is L1 vertebra. I will remove it. And you see, in this L2 vertebra, I will remove it. And you see, this is the spinal cord that is ending in the L2 vertebra upper border. But whereas, if you look at the dural sac, it is ending at the sacral S1 vertebra. That means what? The spinal cord level is here, but the dural sac uh, level is at the sacral vertebra. And it is ending as a small thread called as the phylum terminal. This is a small thread called as the phylum terminal. Okay, so this is the importance you have to understand about the dural sheath.
this is important you have to understand about the duration so that means what the full dural matter is covering the whole brain as well as the spinal cord is covering the whole brain as well as the spinal cord okay so now at base of the brain at the base of the brain if you look at the skull if you look at the skull this is the sphenoid bone this is the I will, yeah this is the sphenoid bone okay if you look at the sphenoid bone this is called as the anterior clinoid and posterior clinoid process okay this is called as the anterior clinoid this two point is called as anterior clinoid process and this two point is called as posterior clinoid process on this there is a membrane and this fossa is called as a pituitary fossa okay on this there is a membrane called diaphragmatic cella this diaphragmatic cella is nothing but the uh, concentration of this dural sac now if you see this is that diaphragmatic cella you can see the diaphragmatic cella here okay in the diaphragmatic cella there is a hole that allows the pituitary stalk to come and stay and form the pituitary gland okay so the pituitary gland is housed in the pituitary fossa that is the cella tersica or also called as hypophyseal fossa of the sphenoid bone so this is a membrane that is present on this uh, sphenoid bone that's called as diaphragmatic cella that is the concentration of this dura matter that is the concentration of this dura matter okay so now the dura matter is finished i am removing the cranial dura matter and the spinal dura matter okay and this is the next membrane is a transparent membrane called as arachnoid matter this is the transparent membrane called as the arachnoid matter okay so this is you can see how transparent it is you can see this is a transparent membrane okay this membrane is also coming up to the sacral vertebra this membrane also this membrane also coming up to the tip of the uh, sacral vertebra this membrane is also coming to the tip of the sacral vertebra suppose if i take a knife and make a small incision here then the csf fluid starts to ooze that means what when i cut this membrane there is csf fluid that is circulating in this place okay so this csf fluid as you know it is produced in the ventricle of the brain this csf fluid is is produced in the ventricle of the brain i'll come back to that it is produced in the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle okay so for that i have to open this okay so here this is the fourth ventricle so from lateral ventricle it comes to third ventricle this is the third ventricle from third ventricle through cerebellar duct it comes to the fourth ventricle okay this is the cerebellar duct this is the fourth ventricle this is the fourth ventricle from this fourth ventricle it is passing to the central canal of the spinal cord as well as this is a fluid coming around the full brain and spinal cord okay that is the subarachnoid space so what i am doing i am touching this outer surface of the brain that is a pia matter and now i am touching the uh arachnoid matter okay this is arachnoid matter so let me arrange the arachnoid matter so this is the dura this is the dura this is the dura so what happens here from that lateral aperture and the middle aperture the csf comes to this membrane the csf comes to this membrane and it is circulating around the whole brain and the spinal cord is circulating around the whole brain and spinal cord this is how the brain and spinal cord is placed on the tub of water where the brain and spinal cord is floating okay so the important clinical application you need to understand here is the spinal anesthesia okay 
so what you see i will arrange this guy so in spinal anesthesia what happens your aim of uh, giving spinal anesthesia is to inject the uh, nerve blocking agent around the nerve okay is to inject the nerve blocking agent around the nerve so whenever you need to do spinal anesthesia you have to select l3 l4 space this is l2 vertebra this is l3 vertebra this is l4 vertebra so up to l2 vertebra upper border the spinal cord is coming so you have to select this l3 l4 space okay so what you do you have to and i remove this i remove the l2 vertebra and i remove the l1 vertebra so what you can see if you give injection in spinal uh, puncture lumbar puncture here in this region between uh, L1 and L2, you may puncture the spinal cord. So, the safest site for giving lumbar puncture is L3, L4 vertebra in this. This is L4 vertebra. You feel the spinous process of L4 vertebra and uh, you, you have to inject in this place. So, once you inject, what happens? The xylocaine, that is the nerve blocking agent, will be distributed around this nerve around this bunch of nerves so all the sensory impulse that is take carried by this nerve is blocked so this is the safest site to give spinal blocks spinal anesthesia okay so this is so here is the the spinal cord level extend up to l2 to l2 upper border whereas for children's up to uh, 7 to 10 years the spinal cord level extend up to L3 vertebra upper border okay as the person goes the spinal cord is pulled up so this is anatomical concentration you have to give when you do lumbar puncture either to take the CSF sample for examination or to use spinal anesthesia okay so coming back here coming back here let's go back to the uh, spinal uh, meninges. Let's go back to the meninges. So, okay. So, okay. So, what you see here is the uh, the previous slide. Okay. So, what you have seen here is the cranial dura mater and the meningeal dura mater the cranial dura mater and the meningeal dura mater so what happens the meningeal dura mater is folding in between the hemispheres and creating the fox cerebri whereas the cranial dura mater is like this so in this place this ural venous sinus is running so i have shown you the superior cycle sinus inferior cycle sinus sinus transverse sinus and the occipital sinus so this uh, transverse sinus changes into sigmoid sinus in the right, right side and left side and then it is forming the jugular vein and the blood goes to the jugular heart okay. so in this place uh, what you have to understand here is the next layer the arachnoid membrane you see this is a transparent membrane this arachnoid membrane is just a very transparent membrane okay you can see this arachnoid membrane just projects inside the dura mater like this is called as arachnoid villi this is called as arachnoid villi okay i will tell you the importance of arachnoid villi okay. so here like this the arachnoid matter is uh, covering the whole brain spinal cord so and the pia matter if you see this is sticking on the surface of the whole brain and the spinal cord so there is the space between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter is called as sub arachnoid space so in this sub arachnoid space only you have this blood vessels you have this arteries veins and the csf fluid cerebrospinal fluid is circulating so when i was teaching about the fourth ventricle 
I have told you how the CSF from fourth ventricle escaped into the subarachnoid space and it is circulating around the whole brain and the spinal cord. It is circulating around the whole brain and spinal cord. Okay. So there are three folds that is the Fox cerebrae, the fold between the two cerebrum, Fox cerebellae, the fold between two cerebellum, and the tentorium cerebellae that is the uh, membrane like a tent on the cerebellum. Cerebellum, okay, membrane like a tilt, disappearing. So the dural venous sinus is formed between the folds of this cranial and meningeal dura matter. Cranial and meningeal dura matter. But the cranial dura matter is inside the cranium. But the meningeal dura matter is covering the whole brain as well as the spinal cord. Okay. So here you can see this is a superior sagittal sinus. And this is the inferior sagittal sinus, straight sinus, and then the transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, and the jugular vein comes like this and goes to the heart. Okay, so now uh, I have told something about the arachnoid villi. Okay, so the arachnoid, if you look at this previous slide, see this arachnoid villi. Okay. See, there is a small mathematical calculation here. Okay? The overall volume of CSF that is circulating in the ventricle as well as around the brain and spinal cord is 150 ml. Okay. So, in 24 hours, 750 ml of CL CSF is produced by this choroid plexus. Is produced by the choroid plexus. Choroid plexus, you know, that is a filter-like substance that is present in the walls of the ventricles inside the brain that filters the CSF fluid from the blood plasma. That filters the CSF fluid from the blood plasma. So, uh, 750 minus 150, how much? What happens to this 600 ml? I told you there are only under and total volume of CSF that is present the whole brain and spinal cord around the uh, the ventricles is 150 ml. But in 24 hours time, 750 ml of CSF is produced. That means what? This 600 is ml of CSF goes back into the venous circulation like this. Goes back into the venous circulation like this. Okay, so when it goes back into venous circulation, that means what? There is continuous production of uh, CSF in the ventricle and the continuous escape of CSF in, sub, in the subarachnoid space to the pure venous sinus. Okay, so this is hard you have to understand. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the composition of CSF, it has water, proteins, 4 to 5. A lymphocyte cell okay then bilirubin if you inject the uh, tap csf it looks like a color of urine a slight amount of bilirubin is present okay so these are the composition of csf cerebrospinal fluid so in case if uh, there are uh, uh, 40 to 50 the lymphocyte cell that means what it is the brain is having some sort of tuberculosis infection okay so only in uh, tuberculosis the lymphocyte cell count will go up okay or uh, if the csf is red in color when you tap the csf and you see the color csf that means what there is some sort of bleeding that is taking place either in the ventricle or in the uh, subarachnoid space. Okay. So likewise, if the pain level <coughs> high in the CSF, it means there is some sort of viral infection to the meninges of the brain. Okay. So all these clinical aspects you have to consider and especially whenever there is a meningeal uh, 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 inflammation 
it leads to meningeal signs that is called nuchal rigidity that is stiffness stiffening of the neck and the paraspinal muscles okay that's called as nuchal rigidity with high fever so this is a correct sign of meningeal inflammation or meningeal irritation okay so these are the clinical points you have to consider so let me show you some example okay what you see here is enlarged head what you see here is enlarged <coughs> head so this condition is called as hydrocephalus that is accumulation of more amount of csf in the brain so when when there is more collection of csf what happens the suture bones joints of the skull does not unite okay when the suture is not uniting the skull separates and head starts to enlarge this is called as hydrocephalus okay so this is due to block of this arachnoid villi that is the uh, csf is not going back from arachnoid villi to the dura vena sinus so that's why this kind of hydrocephalus uh, situation arises this kind of hydrocephalus situation is we have to connect a tube to the this region to the subarachnoid sp space and you have to take the tube and leave it to the peritoneum we call it as ventricular peritoneal shunting so the <coughs> excess uh, csf flow will go to the peritoneum and it will be absorbed there in the peritoneum whereas if suddenly in case if uh, uh, this um, block happens in the adult okay if this arachnoid villi is blocked in the adult okay <clears throat> what you see here is this is a cerebral tissue and there is block in the cerebral aqueduct or this arachnoid villi is block if there is block in the cerebral aqueduct or interventricular foramen the ventricular dilatation takes place so when ventricular dilatation takes place there is more amount of csf fluid that is compressing this complete uh, cerebral tissues that is compressing the complete cerebral tissue so this leads to in increase intracranial pressure and the patient suffers from fits and he will, he will die because in this place what happens the suture bones will not separate in the adult if it is newborn baby the suture bones will not be united and it, 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 it will not allow the bone to unite okay so this is the difference between intracranial pressure and the hydrocephalus uh, baby okay so these are all the simple flow hydrostatic uh, flow mechanism you have to understand during the uh, csf uh, the csf that plays a role okay so coming back here this is the arachnoid matter it is a vascular it is a vascular and collagen fiber Uh, and surrounds the whole brain and spinal cord subdural space space between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater and uh, subarachnoid space is the space between pia mater and the arachnoid mater where the csf is circulating where the csf is circulating okay then uh, <coughs> uh, csf volume is around 150 ml okay it protects the uh, full brain and spinal cord it keeps uh, nourishing and acts as a shock absorber it gives nourishment uh, then it carry it consists of glucose proteins lactic acid urea cations anions and all this stuff okay so this is the composition but no rbcs are present okay? so here you can see this blue area is the arachnoid will subarachnoid space this is the subarachnoid space and this is arachnoid villi where the csf has to circulate where the csf has to circulate 
now coming here uh, this is uh, lateral ventricle it comes to third ventricle then it comes to fourth ventricle from the fourth ventricle through the lateral aperture the cs surface is escaping into the subarachnoid space and that c surface is circulating around the whole brain as well as the <coughs> spinal cord as well as the spinal cord okay so this is the uh, this is how the uh, so how the csf is produced that you have to understand so you can see there are some filter like substance there are some filter like substance in the lateral ventricle third ventricle and also the fourth ventricle this filter like substance that is choroid plexus c h o o i d choroid plexus okay plexus also called as blood brain barrier this is also called as the blood brain barrier okay so you know you would have studied this is made up of these uh, <coughs> ependymal cells and the uh, astrocyte cells okay in nervous tissue you would have studied so this is how the uh, choroid <coughs> plexus is filtering the blood and producing the csf and the excess csf goes back into this venous circulation in this place in this arachnoid villi okay so this flow should be continuously happening so if there is block here the cerebral aqueduct then the ventricles will dilate if there is block here then the brain will start to shrink because the subarachnoid space will start to increase okay so in both the way it is dangerous in both the way it is dangerous so in case of uh, bleeding inside the ventricle that blood clot can come and block this cerebral aqueduct okay that's why for any cerebrovascular accident physicians they don't uh, do any treatment and moreover there is one dangerous condition called subarachnoid subdural hematoma you can see here <coughs> okay this is a ct scan of subdural hematoma you see there is collection of blood in the subdural space there is collection of blood in the subdural space and here you can see there is enormous amount of blood collection so this is happening in this is very common in the road traffic accident when the person falls down and hits the head there are chances of accumulation of bleeding in this uh, subarachnoid space that leads to compression you know the midline this is a midline but the midline is uh, shifting here to the left of the midline shift is present due to excess amount of blood collection why this is happening because there is one blood vessel called middle meningeal artery there is one blood vessel called as the middle meningeal artery so that middle meningeal artery is uh, uh, damage that gets damage during the time of road traffic accident i will show you how okay. this is the skull this is the skull <coughs> these are the blood vessels present in the external surface external surface i will remove that to confuse you okay now when i remove this temporal bone you can see there is blood vessel inside so this blood vessel is called as the middle meningeal artery this blood vessel is called as the middle meningeal artery this artery is running between the skull bone as well as the dura mater you can see here this is running between the skull bone and so as the dura mater so this is a direct branch this is a direct branch from the external carotid artery from the external carotid artery it goes into the cranium and this blood vessel is running between this blood vessel is running you can see here this blood vessel is this blood vessel is running between the skull bone 
as well as dura mater. So when the person hits the head on the floor, when the person hits the head on the floor, this blood vessel is prone for rupture and it leads to accumulation of blood in the subdural space. So that will leading to compression of the brain. So uh, the bleeding is gradually progressive in nature. It's not, it is not very fast. This bleeding will be gradually progressive in nature. So the patient will be taken to the hospital and uh, he, he will be healthy and he will go home. So after 2-3 hours, he will start to vomit. So vomiting fits all these are signs of increased intracranial pressure. So when he starts to vomit, naturally, that means what? The bleeding is increasing. Bleeding is increasing. <coughs> and finally, we need to make holes, bud holes, and we have to remove the pressure as early as possible and like in this artery otherwise it will lead to dangerous situation of your life threatening situation. That's the importance of subdural hematoma. Okay, that's the importance of subdural hematoma we have to know. Okay. Okay, so let's come back. So this is <coughs> this is the circulation uh, you have to understand and the uh, uh, anatomy of it. So next uh, this uh, 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 arachnoid membrane, the blood brain barrier, that is the choroid plexus, is the semi membrane that is present in the uh, walls of the ventricles. Okay, they are nothing but uh, they are present along the capillaries and consist of tight junctions. So they are made up of astrocytes and epidermal cells. <coughs> okay. Next, coming to the spinal cord. This spinal cord is starting at the foramen magnum, the largest hole in the base of the skull. Okay, along with the, the structures that are passing through the foramen magnum are uh, spinal cord, two vertebral arteries, 11th spinal nerve, the spinal nerve, and the meninges. So these are the structures that is passing through the foramen magnum. Okay. So in this objective, um, uh, we will uh, describe how the CS of blood brain barrier protects the CNS, okay, and uh, the circulatory pathway that we uh, explain now. So <coughs> coming to the spinal cord, it starts in the foramen magnum and ends in upper border of L2 vertebra, okay. It is 42 centimeter long, 1.8 centimeter thick, okay, in the cervical level but it is thin in the thoracic level okay so it's a uh, it is a major reflex center protected by the vertebral column meninges in the csf the dura and the arachnoid matter are extending up to s2 vertebra spinal cord ends as a conus medullary the tip of the spinal cord we call it as uh, conus medullary which is in fact connected to the phylum terminal I will show you in the previous model. So mm, you can see. Let's go to the model. Okay. Now what you see here is the. Okay, the spinal cord, it starts, this is a C1 vertebra I'm removing and C2 vertebra I'm removing. This area what, what is called as the file uh, foramen magnum. This area what you see here is the foramen magnum. Okay, this is a foramen magnum. I will remove and now if you come down, all the blue color area what you see is the dura matter, dura matter that is extending up to the spinal sacral vertebra, L5 vertebra, L4 vertebra, L2 vertebra and L1 vertebra. Okay, this is third lumbar vertebra, this is second lumbar vertebra. Okay, now when I remove this uh, dura matter, you can see the arachnoid matter. And inside this arachnoid matter, you have the CS of circulation. Okay, I'll remove the arachnoid matter. Now I don't see at the 
L2 vertebra and the L, L1 vertebra lower border, you have this uh, spinal cord ending. I have to remove this. Okay, now and this is the uh, ending of the spinal cord. Okay, if you see the spinal cord ends as a cone, you see this is called as conus medullaris. Okay, this is called as conus medullaris. Now, if I remove the full skull and show you, you see this is the starting point that is the uh, foramen magnum. This is the starting point that's the foramen magnum and it is coming all the way up to L2 upper border on the adult whereas in children's the spinal cord level is up to L3 upper border okay so you have to do lumbar puncture only in L4 L5 okay for children so you have to be very careful with that don't puncture the spinal cord okay now <coughs> for, so coming here coming here in this area if you see uh, the spinal cord is 40 centimeter long and it has cervical enlargement. In the cervical region, the spinal cord is thick, and in the lumbar region, the spinal cord is thick. Okay, you see the, the thickness in the this lumbar enlargement, and this is the cervical enlargement. The cervical enlargement. Okay, and now uh, the spinal cord ends as a the cone like structure is called as the conus medullaris and this conus medullaris the phylum terminal extends okay the phylum, phylum terminal is extending as a ligament in the okay let's see phylum terminal okay and now let's go to the slide and look at the cross section of the spinal cord if you cut the spinal cord what kind of uh, uh, structure you see that's important okay so here what you have you are seeing here is this cervical enlargement as well as lumbar enlargement and the respective nerve as you know there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that is coming in between each adjacent vertebras and here in the bottom area since the spinal cord is ending in L2 level the nerve originates and comes down like a bunch okay this bunch of nerves is called as corda equina it's a latin word its meaning the meaning of this word is horse tail okay so this bunch of nerves appears like a horse tail it appears like a horse tail that's why it's called as corda equina so there is a small question if there is fracture of l3 vertebra what will happen it is not going to damage the spinal cord it is going to damage the bunch of spinal nerves okay that's called as corda equina syndrome okay so as i told you you upper motor neuron lesion means damage in the brain and spinal cord the muscle will be spastic lower motor neuron lesion means damage in the nerves either this part of the nerves or this nerves okay we call it as the muscle will be flaccid so if a patient is coming with a flaccid loose leg to your clinic that means that is in both uh, and both the legs are paralyzed with the loose first flaccidity that means there is fracture below l3 vertebra okay if the patient is coming stiff leg okay that means the spinal cord is damaged the fracture may be above uh, l1 vertebra okay in pa paraplegia means paralysis of both legs so this is simple clinical thing okay so simple thing you have to understand okay now here we we'll go to the next slide okay so this is the uh, lower end of the spinal cord this is the l2 level this is the l2 level this is l2 level okay so this is the spinal nerves that is coming with the glass and <coughs> 
actually this is not L2 level this is a cervical level because because here is the place where the foramen magnum is starting here is the place where this foramen magnum is starting so and this is the uh, thoracic uh, spinal cord okay and this is a lumbar spinal cord the, at the L2 level the spinal cord ends at the L2 level the spinal cord upper border L2 upper border the spinal cord ends and this bunch of this nerves is called as cauda equina and the phylum terminal is a thin ligament structure that is attached to the sacral vertebra okay I hope you understood so when it comes to lumbar puncture you have to puncture here in order to uh, take the CSF sample for analysis or if you inject uh, nerve blocking agent like xylocaine, sensor cane, all these things then it, it blocks all this nerve and the pain is not going to the brain and you can do the operation in the lower limb okay even for c-section we, we give lumbar puncture okay so lumbar puncture is a very important clinical thing all you have to do is you have to palpate this uh, leg crest and straight posterior to that is l3 l4 space okay anterior superior leg spine you know straight back side is the l3 l4 space and where you can inject the needle you can inject the needle and uh, suck when you get csf that is subarachnoid space. There you can directly inject the cervical. Okay. So now coming to the cross section of the spinal cord. Okay. You know this is the vertebral canal where the spinal cord is passing. So when you cut the spinal cord, this is anterior view. This is anterior view. This is a posterior because the lumbar body, the body of the lumbar vertebras are present in the anterior side okay so the gray matter is in the shape of h the gray matter is in the shape of h in the in, in the aspect spinal cord with, there is a small hole called as the central canal this is the continuation of the l uh, the fourth ventricle now. okay now the outer area has the white matter the outer area has the white matter white matter okay so here the this is anterior the anterior horn cell is present in the gray matter and the posterior horn cell is present in the white matter so the anterior horn cell gives the anterior motor fiber posterior horn cell gives the posterior sensory fiber both these fibers comes and joins here to form the ganglion from the ganglion the nerve axons are traveling okay so this area is called as the interventricular intervertebral foramen okay so in, through which the nerve is exiting or we can see the formation of the ganglion okay so in this ganglion there are separate autonomic ganglion that i will teach you in the autonomic nervous system okay don't get confused with that okay this is the cross section of the spinal cord and uh, you have the meninges these are all the meninges these are all the meninges these are the meningeal tissues that is extending a little bit out of the spinal uh, intervertebral foramen okay so you can see the uh, anterior fibers this is anterior fiber posterior fiber forming the uh, ganglion and the nerve root okay so the dura matter, arachnoid matter and pia matter is just sticking on the spinal cord. Okay. This is the subarachnoid space, subdural space. Okay, coming back, you have the um, uh, posterior horn cells and the anterior horn cell and this is central canal. And in the uh, spinal cord, there are ascending and descending tracks. Okay, this track is little. Uh, don't I don't think it is confusing, but as a medical profession, we have to know these tracks. Okay, as I told you, the uh, corticospinal tract that is uh, starting in the cerebral cortex and coming all the way down to the spinal cord, and these are the tracks called ascending tracks and the descending tracks okay 
so the white matter can composed of myelinated non myelinated nerve fibers okay it has ascending descending it, this tracks runs in the ascending descending aspect so we will see the tracks that is important okay so ascending tracks are sensory tracks taking the sensory nerve impulse to the brain descending tracks are motor tracks that is bringing the nerve impulse from the brain cerebral cortex towards the lower end aspect of the spinal cord okay so there are in ascending tracks there are dorsal tracts that is fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cunatus spino cerebellar tract that is dorsal and ventral tract spino thalamic tract that is lateral and ventral tract okay that is means what the spino cerebellar means it is connected to the spine i mean spinal cord as well as cerebellum spino thalamic means it is connected to the spinal cord and the thalamus okay whereas descending tracts are corticospinal that's a pyramidal tract corticospinal also called as pyramidal tract also called as a projection fibers in that you have lateral corticospinal ventral corticospinal then you have the rubro spinal then reticulospinal vestibulospinal and tectospinal tract okay no you have to memorize all these nerves so okay. the descending tracts are corticospinal rubrospinal reticulospinal vestibulospinal and tectospinal okay there is the tracts that is sensory tracts are dorsal fasciculus gracilis, fasciculus cunatus, spino cerebellar, and spino thalamic. Okay, these are the various tracks that is taking the nerve impulse and bringing the nerve impulse. Okay, these tracks are present in the spinal cord. Okay, so spinal cord trauma, as such, you know, and there is a, a trauma of the spinal cord. Uh, the, if there is damage in the cervical level, all four limbs will be paralyzed. We call it as uh, quadriplegia. If there is damage above L1 vertebra, both the lower limb will paralyze with spasticity tightness. That is called as paraplegia. Paralysis of both limb, lower limb is called as paraplegia. If there is fracture of vertebra below L3 or L4 then also both lower limb will paralyze but it will be loose paralysis that is flaccid paralysis so keep this in mind any damage to brain or spinal cord it gives plastic paralysis any damage to the spinal nerves it gives flaccid paralysis okay this is what you have to understand. So, poliomyelitis is an infectious condition which is caused by poliovirus and it, it is a sort of ascending paralysis. It starts to damage the anterior horn cell of the lower end of the spine, but gradually it progresses up. So, nowadays the paralysis polio cases are very less as we are vaccinating uh, after childbirth. This is a polio vaccine. You have to if you don't vaccinate then there are chances of polio attack and leads to paralysis of the lower limb okay if it is very chronic and go paralysis to all four limbs and in the top cervical it can also paralyze the diaphragm it can also paralyze the diaphragm so nowadays this polio myelitis spread is under good control okay so now we have to go into the neural pathway you have to go into the neural pathway. In neuronal pathway, I have told you, I have been discussing about this uh, ascending and descending tracks. Okay. So, this is what we call it as pathway. Okay. Now, as uh, we have discussed about the ascending uh, tract and the descending tract a little bit. So, in this objective, you will be knowing about the different type of pathways um, i mean the ascending and the descending tracks okay then in this uh, objective under this objective you will be we will be discussing about the 
crossing of these pathways, as I told, the decussation means the right brain fibers is coming to the left side of the spinal cord and controlling the left side of the body. Whereas the left brain fibers that is coming to the right side of the spinal cord and controlling the right side of the body. Okay, so this decussation pathway you will understand. That is, I told you the decussation takes place at the level of the pons and middle oblongata. Okay, and also the other relay pathways, okay, and the somatic and symmetric pathways. This is what we are going to discuss in the subjective. Okay, now if you see in this picture, this is the spinocerebellar pathway. Okay, this is the spinocerebellar pathway. Uh, you, you know, this is ascending pathway. That is, the sensory, uh, the uh, the uh, sensory impulse from the muscle is going to the spinal cord, the posterior on posterior fiber. From posterior fiber, it is going up. Okay, it's going up up to the thalamus cerebellum okay up to the pons then it is going to the cerebellum okay so that is the pathway of the spino cerebellar pathway between the spinal cord and the cerebellum it is taking the sensory impulse about the body balance or whatever it is whereas if you look at the dorsal column medial lemiscal pathway if you look at the medial, this is a descending track. This pathway, if you observe carefully, it starts from the cerebral cortex. It comes to the thalamus. From thalamus, it comes down all the way up to the level of the middle oblongata. From the right side, it is going to the left side. So this is the right brain. This is the left brain. This is the right spinal cord and this left spinal cord. So what happens here? This fibers starts all the way in the cerebral cortex and then at the level of the middle oblongata it goes to the left spinal cord and it is coming all the way down left spinal cord so that means this right side brain is controlling the left body hand movement foot movement everything okay so this is one thing the decussation the importance of decussation that is crossing of this right brain fiber to the left spinal cord you have to understand okay here then Coming to the ascending pathways, that is, these are all the sensory pathways, that is, taking the uh, impulse, and, I mean, pain or sensory impulse from the periphery of the body and it is coming all the way to the spinal cord. And these neurons are taking the messages in the ascending manner towards the brain or cerebellum, whatever it is. So, in that, you have first order neuron then the second order neuron and the third order neuron okay this is what we're going to see here you look at this spinothalamic pathway this is ascending tract so you can see the sensation is coming all the way from the spinal cord and then i mean from the spinal cord from the spinal cord it goes to the right side it comes to left side and it is coming all the way up to the uh, spine and the thalamus as I told you uh, these fibers are connected from the spinal cord to the thalamus from the thalamus a uh, different axon is taking impulse to the uh, uh, sensory area of the parietal lobe okay so this is the spinothalamic pathway that is connected to the spine and the thalamus okay so <clears throat> you can see here the impulse is in the spinal cord itself the message gets uh, from the right side it is going to the left uh, from the left side it is going to the right side and it is ascending all the way up and it is ascending all the way up okay so like pain receptors temperature receptors all these receptors are passing through the spinothalamic pathway to the thalamus thalamus is the boss of all sensory system okay it decides what is what okay next you have the ascending pathway to the brain that's the dorsal column you have the dorsal white column okay you have the dorsal white column for the discontinued touch and vibration sense and spinothalamic pathway for pain and temperature that we discussed in the previous slide and spinocerebellar pathway that we discussed in the previous slides that is going connected to the spine as well as to the cerebellum okay this is two sense the body balance 
equilibrium of the body, posture of the body. Likewise, different. Any ascending pathway means it is sensory pathway connecting to cerebellum, thalamus or cerebral cortex, whatever it is. Okay. Then descending pathways. As I told you, there are corticospinal tracts, rumospinal tracts, reticulospinal tracts, vestibulospinal tracts, and tectospinal tracts. These are the descending tracts, descending pathways. Okay. So the corticospinal tract is also called as the pyramidal tract that is starting all the way from cerebral cortex and then coming all the way down okay so here the decussation is taking place at the level of the pons and then it is that is how the right brain is controlling the left body left brain is controlling the right body so it is upper motor neurons uh, it is having the upper motor neurons that is present in the brain and the spinal cord whereas lower motor neurons are present in the peripheral nerves only the over motor neurons are present in the peripheral nerves only let's uh, look at the de descending pathway uh, if you come here the cerebral cortex is starting here okay and then it is coming all the way to the basal ganglia and it is uh, this is a cerebellum and the pons okay so from the pons and in the middle of longata there is decussation see left brain fiber the left brain fiber see here the the you see this is the right brain and this is the left brain from the left brain the fiber starts all the way and it is coming through the cerebral peduncle here it is touching the basal ganglia this here is the basal ganglia the basal ganglia releases the information and then it is coming all the way to the middle oblongata. In the middle oblongata, it is crossing. You see, from the left brain, it is going to the right side of the spinal cord and going down all the way and it is controlling the uh, right side body muscles. Okay. So this is the pyramidal tract. That is the lateral ventricle corticospinal pathway. This is the, this is the, the word decussation that is crossing of the fiber from right side of the brain to the left side okay left side of the brain to the right side this is important likewise right side of the brain to the left side so this is where the decussation is taking place that is why the right brain is controlling the left body the left brain is controlling the right body okay then this is the rubrospinal tract which is present in the lateral aspect of the spinal cord so if you look at this there is red nucleus there is red nucleus that is connected uh, to the cerebellum that is connected to the cerebellum so what happens this rubrospinal tract it is also going all the way to the uh, left side of the spinal cord and then the middle of lung it is going to the right side red nucleus and from right side it is going to the cerebellum here okay so the uh, uh, cerebellum is sending the message from the right side cerebellum the message comes to the left side of the body okay so this is how the right cerebellum is controlling the left left body okay so keep in mind all the decussation is taking place at the pons and medulla level okay the crossing that is the right brain fibers comes to left side of spinal cord left brain fibers comes to the right side of the spinal cord this is what you have to keep in mind okay lateralization so if you have any doubts you can ask and uh, this